Welcome into the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show. It is April 11th, 2024, 7 p.m. in the Eastern Time Zone. So glad to have you uh, joining us, and, and it's going to be a fun two hours tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I am Eric Balkman from the FFPC, the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show. Actually, this is the HSFF Show. I'm also from the HSFF Hour, and of course, the road of his High Stakes Slowdown. Uh, catch me on the X at Eric Balkman. Want to welcome in tonight's guest host, you know him. Uh, if you've been in this industry for one week, one month, one decade, one century, you know this guy. Sorry to date you a little bit, Bob. Right. Bob Harris at Football Die Hard on X from Football Guys at Football Guys, FootballGuys.com. Bob, thank you so much for, for joining the show tonight. Really appreciate it, man. Man, it's an honor to be on. I'm really glad you invited me and looking forward to chopping it up for a couple hours. I'm going to talk about the FFPC in a little bit, but before we get to that, it's rare that I have somebody – with your experience on the show. And and I know that comes with like, and, and I know you don't care, but like some people would say, oh, he's got a lot of experience. He's an old guy. He doesn't get it. Yeah. You get it because you have rolled with the punches. You have adjusted with everything over the course of really the entirety of the fantasy football industry. If there is one thing that has <clears throat> changed the most significantly, the, the most with the most um, uh, force over the course of your coverage of fantasy football, for throughout your career what's it been zero rb has it been like um the advent of wide receivers and obviously tight ends um the the the, the how the nfl has shifted from a rushing lead to a passing lead there's a lot of different things to tackle here bob in your experience mm. what's been the biggest thing you're like oh my goodness this has been the toughest thing for me to adjust to there have been so many over the years and you know like to me the biggest development in all of fantasy football the thing that changed the face of fantasy football if we go back to like my start in 93 was around 96 97 when the rise of commissioning software that mm. that, that changed the face of the game for the end of our game from the fantasy perspective <clears throat> I want to say it's kind of been like, you know, the recent, some of the more recent things, like you get caught up in your ways. Like, obviously we went from, you know, the, the NFL using true feature backs. When I first started playing in 86, that was the, that was the key. You had the, you know, everyone had two, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you, you know, everyone in your league had two strong feature backs and you could pick up replacements very easily. Now it's the running, the shift in the usage of running backs, I think has been the trickiest thing for me because you still want those high volume guys there's a narrow band of those that I still invest in heavily. But after that, it gets pretty dicey. So, you know, you run into some, like, you know, there are times when you end up doing a, an RB3 or a zero RB build or, or something similar to that, mm -hmm. at least, you know, like a hero RB. <clears throat> and it works out perfectly well. So I think, you know, getting over the, overcoming the fears from the changes is probably the biggest obstacle. But the, the running back position in particular has been the one that's the most daunting. I think um, it, it, with the changes of the running back position, we'll get into that a little bit tonight with the way that we are treating running backs, not only for best ball, but for rookie drafts as well. I think it's changed, and I think it's changed the way we yeah. build teams. We'll definitely get into that. By the way, uh, before I get into uh, to the show, uh, Empire League is now available at myffpc.com, as well as the Fantasy Pros Championship live at uh, myffpc.com, myffpc.com. Check out the Never Too Early Best Ball Tournaments. Those will be closing. <laughs> closing in like two weeks or so. Um, and uh, Dynasty Orphans, Dynasty Startups, all available at myffpc.com. Matt Deutsch is our producer tonight, uh, producer tonight. Shout out to him. We'll go through, uh, coming up on the show, we'll go through everything that's going on around the NFL. I do want to go back in time a little bit uh, with, the, with the start of 2024 free agency because I know Bob has some things to talk about with Russell Wilson, maybe a little bit of CeeDee Lamb, uh, and and we got to talk about this Brazil matchup in week one because it's the only game we know for sure what two teams are playing in week one so we can get a uh, hit, uh, hit on that as well. We're going to find out where Bob stands on certain players like Derrick Henry, Zamir White, Christian Watson, Anthony Richardson, and much more. And then in the second hour, let's get into some rookie stuff. Malik Neighbors, Ray Davis, who the Cowboys are going to draft, if anyone, in the 2024 draft, Brock Bowers, and so much more. And then with free agency and everything that's been going on over the course of the last four weeks, I think it's important to figure out who are the dynasty buys, sells, and holds. We'll get into that. Deontay Johnson, the Vikings, skill position players with the unknown at quarterback there, Dak Prescott, and much more. That is what's coming mm -hmm. up on the show. Let's kick things off with kind of a somber note, but I mean, uh, the, the thing I've learned, especially over the course of the last uh, 15 years or so, Bob, we have to separate fantasy from reality. Now, some people don't want to do that. Some people are like, you know what? I'm not going to draft these scumbags. I'm not going to draft people on my team that have this laundry list of, of run-ins with the law or anything like that. And I totally respect that. And I get it. 
this is what it always comes down to. Like, and you get this all the time with people asking, Hey, what should I do here? What should I do here? It always comes back when people ask me that it's your team. I'm going to offer you my advice. I'm going to tell you what I would do, but it is your team. You run it the way you want with the stuff like, and we'll get into Rasheed Rice here with stuff like this. It's like, I know there's people who are like, he's off my board. I don't want to have anything to do with paying attention to my fantasy team throughout the 2024 season with a guy who was involved in something uh, as careless, as reckless, and that could have been a lot worse than it actually was. And I get that. Now, for me, I'm not drafting players. I'm drafting stats, right? That's how I look at it. And so I understand that if I don't draft Rasheed Rice, that's fine for, for like my moral compass or whatever, but understanding that everybody else in my league or at least somebody else in my league will be drafting him <clears> and they will be using them against me, right? So, I, I mean, maybe it's rationalization. I don't know what it was. But I have no problem drafting Rasheed Rice because it's his stats. I'm not drafting him as a player. He's not going to become my best friend or the best man at my wedding or anything like that. So with Rasheed Rice, the latest we have on this, and you can weigh in on that if you want. No problem. If you don't want to, that's that's fine. WFAA reports that an arrest warrant has gone out for Rasheed Rice for his involvement in that multi-vehicle crash in Dallas late last month. Six counts of collision involving bodily injury, one count of collision involving uh, serious bodily injury, and one count of aggravated assault from the arrest warrant. Now, he already has told investigators and the authorities that he was driving the Lamborghini involved uh, in this situation on March 30th in Dallas. He's going to have one day to turn himself in, which we're coming up on right now. It's almost been 24 hours later. 23 years old, he could see an NFL suspension. We don't know exactly what's going to happen legally, as we never do, because the NFL always seems to wait for the legal process to, to, to carry out here. Rasheed Rice, now prior to the Marquise Brown signing, he was being drafted pretty high uh, this year, Bob. And I look at what he's doing right now in drafts, even after this. Wide receiver 22, he slipped a little bit. He's still <clears> a <throat> mid-fourth-round pick. Your level of concern with Rasheed Rice this year, not only with potential suspension, but with Marquise Brown in the fold as well. So a couple of things, uh, you know, though I am quite old, there was a time I was young and I did a lot of stupid things and it didn't make me a horrible person. It made me young and stupid. And I'm hoping that's the case with she Rice. Time will tell, you know, right? Like this is an, to, so far to me, this is an isolated incident. I'm in the area, uh, in the Dallas area. So, and I know he went to school here. So I haven't heard a lot of these, this kind of, you know, talk about him. And we all know the, you know, young people get a little money in their hand, the, uh, uh, the decision making can get even worse. So that aside, <clears throat> I mean, I felt like he was going too high <laughs> prior to all this. Like uh, often in these cases, uh, you know, when I'm looking at a group of receivers or a running back core, or whatever, it's not unusual for me to take the cheaper pieces, especially once Marquise Brown showed up there. Uh, like as my wide receiver four, you, you kind of like I, he's moving up a little bit and, and he'll mo probably move up more on this news as well. But, you know, getting him as a late wide receiver three, a early wide receiver four range in the best balls I've been playing in, that seemed like a really decent gamble to me. And I'll go ahead and throw some darts at that. Rice was going too high for me. I think he's perfectly fine. I, you know, like, uh, I think he can build on last year. And I think the offense, could pro pro I'm probably thinking Patrick Mahomes had a, a down season. It'll be better next year. Uh, but I think the price is too high. There are other players in that same price range that I'd prefer to have. So, so that's, I don't have many shares at, at this point, uh, but no, honestly, I don't have a ton of concern. Like, could he be suspended a game or two? Yes. Does that seem like the most likely outcome? Not really like the most likely. It's, it was well, like right in the middle of the range, right? Like <clears throat> if the felonies hold up, but expecting him to plead out. I know Drew Davenport's been on here. Mm -hmm. My colleague of football guys, a defense attorney runs through all these things. If you're not on his uh, XB, go check him out at Drew Davenport FF. He, covers all these kind of issues. <clears throat> He's pretty optimistic as well. You know, the fact that that Rice was remorseful and came out and said, look, I did it. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll make everything good. And, you know, he'll work with the victims undoubtedly. And my guess is a lot, you know, at least the most, the, the harshest portions of this, the felony portion of this will, will probably get pled down. So if that's the case, I think he'll be in the whole season. Does he, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. The Chiefs had this kind of situation come up before, right? In 2019, uh, Tyree killed. There was the issue where he was investigated for his son had a broken arm and he was eventually cleared, but the chiefs just asked him not to show up for OTAs, right? Just don't show up for the workouts. He didn't. They drafted Miko Hardman and we all thought that was like, Ooh, there's like a direct replacement. So, you know, what I tend to watch for in these cases if, are people in my leagues who are overreacting in the moment. Cause that's what we do, right? We're fantasy <laughs> managers. Right? The, the reflexive reaction is to instantly leverage every situation to, uh, to what we perceive to be a gain for us. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, in the moment, 
it's great. You know, maybe you may, you know, in this case, it seems like you're, you know, it's a crapshoot. You're 50, 50. Is it, could it go your way? Yes. Could it go the other way? Yes. So my usual approach is to sit back and wait. And if someone's doing something really, you know, unwise in terms of how they're handling the situation, I'll try to leverage that. But that's, that's my, that's going to be more my approach than trying to sit here and, and figure out what's going to happen in the legal system and how the punishments might be doled out for now. I'm going to stand pat if, in leagues where I have them, dynasty leagues, etc. He's still going to have a long career playing with Patrick yeah. Mahomes. I'm thinking that's probably going to be okay for him. If there's some short-term issues, great. We can look back to Alvin Kamara, though. His what, his thing last year took – it well, it was from two years ago. It took a full year to resolve, right? And the NFL usually doesn't meet out punishments until there's resolution. So – this could drag on for a while in that regard. And even if it doesn't, you know, the narrow band that I would expect him to miss doesn't have a big impact on, on how I view him. I, I think that's the important thing to understand. Like, remember the Alvin Kamara thing with the Pro Bowl a couple of years ago. I mean, that took more yep. than a year for, for Over it to a year. result. And, and now we have Rasheed Rice, who is going, as I said, in the mid-fourth round of best ball drafts. Marquise Brown in the mid to late sixth round of, of, of best ball drafts right now. And I look at both those points right here. And if you believe that this is more a nothing burger than, for lack of a better term, a something burger, Rasheed Rice is a buy. Yeah, Marquise, right now. Marquise yes, Brown, right. I and mean, Marquise Brown is still a buy at the 609, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and like uh, in the early portion of my best ball season, it wasn't unusual seeing Rice go in the third round, sometimes even in the second. People were just mm -hmm. like a little over enthusiastic in my mind. As the price drops, that's when I become interested. And that's what you're looking for. Like sharp fantasy players are looking for the dip, right? And you buy the dip. Anytime you see these circumstances, you know, if you want to act in the moment, you might be wrong. But if you give it a week or two or kind of let it marinate a little bit, you'll maybe find the prices diminish and maybe some other pieces get a little more expensive. And you can leverage those aspects that in the moment, you know, kind of like obsessive compulsion to, to I got to do something about this right now. Uh, that can be what gets you gets you sideways. I want to stay on the AFC, but I'm going to shift positions. Let's go to running backs for Cleveland. Nick Chubb. Um, Ian Rappaport reported earlier this morning, uh, Bob, that the Cleveland Browns have reworked the contract of Nick Chubb for this season. Uh, apparently his base salary has been lowered, uh, from 11.775 million. However, the Browns are still giving him the opportunity to make that much money, but it's based on incentives. Nice. He had that bad knee injury last year, week two of 2023. 28 years old, so certainly not ideal for a running back for an age uh, for an age where they can come back and and be really really good. Um, not saying it's not possible, but it's not great. Um, two major knee injuries in his career now. The other one when he was at Georgia, uh, he suffered. And basically, uh, if he comes back to being the player he was or even better, it will be kind of an anomaly, right? Because we haven't normally seen a whole lot of this. Now, Nick Chubb is still on the team for 2024. The Browns never considered cutting him. He is now going to be working towards incentives. And the thing that I think is so interesting about Chubb, I didn't look at the ADP last year where he was going, but it was high. I mean, you're talking about second, third, at the very latest fourth round, depending upon the type of league you're playing in. Bob, this year, running back, this is the FFPC data I'm looking at right now. Running back 38, he's not going until the 10th round. This is Devin Singletary, mm. Chase Brown, Jalen Wright territory. If you can get a guy like Nick Chubb there, don't you have to jump at that? Because, and we throw around the term <laughs> league winner all the time. But he is a league winner at that level with this sort of, I don't want to say revamped offense, but let's say retooled offense in Cleveland. Nick Chubb is very, very interesting to me in the 10th round. How do you feel about him there? Nick Chubb is. The Chubb that we're getting is that the Nick Chubb. My, my only concern here is, is like, number one, they're very vague about the, the timetable, right? Uh the first, he had two surgeries. He had one in the MCL repaired in September. Then the ACL repair wasn't until November, right? Because they like to do the one so you can immediately start the rehab on the ACL. They like to do those immediately. So, like, I'm hopeful about this, but it's been kind of a mixed bag for guys coming off torn ACLs. Uh, Javante Williams would like you to know these serious injuries. Sometimes it's a slow rise. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm all in on Javante this year. I think the price is right. Brees Hall, we saw issues last year for him where it was a little bit uneven, but he seemed to come back a little quicker than most. And so, like, yes, I think, the, you know, look, everybody, here, here's the thing, Eric, and I think you nailed it. Everybody at the right price. Yeah. <clears throat> right? So is 10th the right price for me? 
when I'm getting players can help me, it depends on how I construct my roster, right? So you can have a risky roster without, you know, without ha- or have risk in your roster without having a risky roster. So if you've built a really solid running back core and you want to take a chance and take a risk on a guy like Chubb in the 10th round, it's not cost prohibitive. Feel free to do it. Um, if you want, if look, if Deontay, if, I'm not sure where the Deontay Foreman is going right now. I've, uh, I picked him up like, uh, I want to say later than that. 17th uh, is yeah. what I'm seeing, 17th right now. You know, I might take some chances with that as well uh, on the cheaper piece. And, you know, he comes in. I mean, Jerome Ford is going fairly, you know, about where you'd expect him to go. So don't know if I'm trying to take action on that. Not against Chubb, but probably looking the looking like there's a lot of lanes down the road. You can just kind of drive down the other one. That's probably what I'm doing with Chubb, just based on the severity of this injury, but also the vagueness of the timetable. The, the Browns, the, the official word is some point in 2024. Well, okay. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> like something a little more concrete. And maybe he's, look, he's a fantastic player. Uh, the, the history of Nick Chubb, uh, like to me, is fascinating because my good buddy, Matt Waldman, if you go back to the 2018, was it? Uh, rookie scouting portfolio. He had him as his running back one over Saquon Barkley, right? And kind of bore out that he was a super good runner, right? <laughs> and, he, and he was everything kind of that Matt wrote in the RSP. And so I've kind of been keen on him. I haven't have him, have him in a lot of dynasty leagues because of that. And uh, and so I'm, you know, I've been super impressed with his work. He's obviously one of the, you know, one of the most effective runners mm-hmm. in the NFL. Uh, but right now, I don't know if I'm, I don't know how much I'll invest. Tenth round, though, is not cost prohibitive to me. Dom Gazzetti uh, joining us tonight. Uh, happy Thursday, Thursday to you, Dom, as well. And Ricardo Martinez chiming in on the chat here too, Bob. Nick Chubb support has sustained from what he's seen. Now, he thinks in theory Nick Chubb is a buy, but dynasty owners don't seem very anxious to trade him away for the price we're expecting. And maybe right. that's just everybody saying like, okay, I've seen what Chubb has done. I don't want to sell for 70 cents on the dollar, 65 cents on the dollar. I want to see how this plays out in Cleveland. And I know your colleagues, Cecil Lamy and Sigmund yep. Bloom, just talking up Deontay Foreman too. An interesting guy that, again, when you're talking about a best ball league where you're trying to win, you know, 25 yep. grand or 10 grand or whatever, you have a, a situation where you can utilize a 17th round pick on Foreman. Maybe he gets you through mm. two games, three games, or maybe two months. You know, you never know how these right. things are going to go. And the price that he's going <clears> at right now, I think, makes a lot of sense. Too. Yeah, almost a free square, right? I mean, there, that's, yeah. what, that's what I'm looking for. Always looking for free square plays. <clears throat> and look, there's nothing that keep, would keep you, depending on how you build your roster, from taking Chubb at the reasonable 10th round cost and then adding Foreman in the mix and avoiding Jerome Ford, who's going a little earlier than right. that. So uh, I'm not against that. Also, I do think he's a hold in dynasty. Like in the leagues I have him, I'm not, you know, there's, you just can't, you can't sell a guy at this point because uh, you're going to get nothing. As you said, the 70 cents on the dollar, if that. I, I've got him in two of my dynasty leagues. I haven't been shopping him and the offers I'm getting in are just total yeah. low balls that I just, I can't even <clears throat> a good conscious counter. Cause I'm like, be real. Okay. I'm not, I'm not trading Nick Chubb for a third round rookie pick or something like something. Probably insane. something like what the Rasheed Rice owners are getting as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> totally true. Um, let's talk about the Tennessee Titans here for a second. Nick Holtz, who is the new offensive coordinator uh, for Tennessee says he sees Tony Pollard and Ty J Spears as quote interchangeable. He thinks it's a one, a one B situation, according to Terry McCormick on the X. Uh, he thinks both backs are going to get a ton of carries. Now this is interesting because Tony Pollard last year, and I had people telling me, well, uh, Bob, I had people and you probably have the same people telling me on both sides of the spectrum. I had one guy who I respect his opinion a lot, told me that if Pollard ever is the guy in Dallas, he is going to blow up and maybe be the number one overall uh, fantasy running back. I also had people telling me, you know, part of the reason Pollard was so successful in Dallas is because he always had the Batman to his Robin or the Robin to his Batman, depending upon how you want to look at it. And he wasn't overused and he remained having a high efficiency uh, for all of his carries and his touches there. Now that played out in 2023 where Pollard was the guy had some injuries and wasn't the same. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is Pollard said in December, and I bring this up all the time, December, Bob, that's when he said, I finally feel like I'm over that injury Mm -hmm. I had in 2022. That's basically the whole season. And Pollard really looked good in 2023 and then going into the 2024 portion of the postseason as well. Tajay Spears versus Pollard right now. I didn't look at the ADP prior to me asking this. I looked at it about five minutes ago, and it really surprised me. Tony Pollard running back 24 yep. at the 709. Tajay Spears 
running back 31 at the yep. 902. You're talking about a difference between these two players of about a round, maybe a round and a half, only seven running backs separating them. That mm. kind of surprised me. I thought Pollard would be going sooner, and I thought Spears would be going later. Maybe the rest of fantasy is kind of catching up and realizing, hey, maybe I'd rather have Spears rather than Pollard, so I'm not going to overdraft Pollard. I'm just going to wait on Spears. How are you handling this situation? Uh, I'm going to wait and see if the, this comment by uh, by Holtz dry, depresses Pollard a little bit. Right. Like So a couple of things about Pollard I think are interesting. What you said is totally true. Like We never really – we usually find out well after the fact uh, what kind of – effect injuries had on a player right Pollard came out and I think it was around week 10 he, you, you started seeing him pick up the pace but there was a huge thing and I talked to uh, Michael Gelkin about this multiple times over the course of last season and, and 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 you can go back to the year before when my old high school rival Skip Pete the running backs coach then the running backs coach of the Cowboys uh <clears throat> was telling us like hey we think he's better he being Pollard is better with a limited snap count right not you know not just carries but limited snaps and that bore out. Last year, you saw his explosive run rate. He, run rate. he went down to 22.8% of breakaway runs per pro football focus. That's way lower. Well, like the year before, 45%. The other part of that that Gelkin, Gelkin talked about was he charted last year was Pollard reaching his high-end speed, which was about 19 plus miles an hour. He was hitting that in 22 on about 4 plus percent of his runs. Last year, it was below 2%. So... It might have been a combination of things, maybe the health, maybe the way he was being used, maybe the amount he was being used, but also maybe the the plays that Mike McCarthy was having him run, where he was having him run, maybe the offensive lines. That he, we like to look at things as single variable equations that aren't, right? We want to simplify things and make them this or that. <clears throat> this seems a little more muddled. I do think, though, like if you're trying to take a positive spin on this and if it's going to depress the price of maybe even both of them a little bit because people are going to be concerned, oh, they're going to be sharing. Well, uh, you know, you saw Ty J Spears, Spears share last year, got 453 yards on 100 carries. You saw him catch, what, 50-plus passes, 52 mm -hmm. passes, 385 mm -hmm. yards. I mean, you know, they can contribute together. But that's the part for me that's tricky, Eric, about the running backs of today is how we – how do we value those – you know, those satellite backs, those players who aren't getting a full workload, but are still viable contributors. And as that pool increases, they become more interesting because obviously there aren't as many of the guys getting the full workloads. Volume to me is still always going to be king, but in cases where you're not getting the full volume, both of these guys are the kind of players they need at Tennessee where you don't have a great offensive line, first of all. Yeah. Um, and we'll see if Brian Callahan <clears throat> brings in his dad, Bill, to coach up the offensive line. That was a great move on their part. Uh, but just in general, I mean, I think they have a lot of pieces. If they run a little different style of offense, it's a little more wide open. I know everyone's copying Mike McDaniels right now. They get that motion going, get their, you know, their speed players moving at speed when they hit the line of scrimmage, going up against flat-footed defenders, trying to go from zero to 100 miles an hour in one step. If we see some creative scheming and, and – there's a reason to believe Brian Callahan could do this. He's the kind of offense we all want to see, the McVay, Shanahan style, you know, filtering out more uh, throughout the league. <clears throat> I'm hopeful. I'd like to see the prices drop a little bit. I thought Pollard was maybe a little high. At, you know, the, I, I've seen him, at, but I think he was 22 on underdog and 24 on best ball tens as well. So, you know, the, the price is pretty uniform across yeah. all the platforms. So <clears throat> I'd like to see the price get depressed a little bit, and I'll try and take advantage of it when it does. Uh, and, and if it depresses even more on Spears, I'll have some of them. I think back to what Rand Carthon talked about, talked about him. You know, he is that, you know, the expletive deleted, he is the uh, shizzle. Right. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, you know, and Carthon is the kind of guy that, you know, I kind of, you know, you can tell what he values mm -hmm. and I think the mentality he'd like to bring to the team, maybe we'll see a little more Spears than we believe. I think it's interesting because, uh, like I I'm kind of with you. I'm surprised Pollard is going as low as he is, but I still want to wait a little bit right. to more to see like, oh, maybe I can get him at running back 28, running back 29. Um, and, and the weird thing is too, and and I don't know how you're feeling on Spears. I haven't really seen Spears move up. Like, this, is, this is more of like, this hurts Pollard more than it helps Spears. So mm -hmm. if you want to get Spears, like, hey, that's fine. Running back 30, <clears throat> running back 31. I think that's that's more than fine. Uh, but the Pollard thing is interesting. I'm going to get greedy here. Looking in the same range, right? I mean, there's some interesting players in there just going a little bit ahead of him, but Najee Harris, Raheem Mostert, who is rising up a little bit, DeAndre Swift, Jalen Warren, you know, kind of looking at that range of guys that he's uh, sitting in. I mean, 
some of those I I think have a little clearer pass to work. I'll go a little earlier and get James Conner. I mean, I think Aaron Jones is still going way too cheap. So I'm probably getting my running back too a little before I hit that Pollard range there if I'm going to running backs that early in a draft. Do you change your running back to <clears throat> philosophy based on whether you're drafting best ball or a managed team, Bob? Uh, I change it up a lot just in general because I'm oh. drafting a ton of best ball teams. You know, I'll have hundreds by the time I get to the season. And and it's mostly just I want to be steeped in the subject and you want to know where values are just kind of at the top of your head when we're having conversations like this. But yeah, I do. And, and I like to experiment. It's kind of like the laboratory so right. that when I get to August, I know what things have worked best or feel best to me you know, and that I feel most comfortable with. And so it will change up noticeably. And a lot of times, you know, the, the approach to running back is the thing that changes the most. I'll go hero a lot and then wait way late or, uh, and I'll do some zero running back and, 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 you know, hope for the good luck. Do you ever look at it um, when you talk about, I mean, cause like FFPC, whatever, uh, right. people are drafting January, February, whatever you're drafting early. Yeah. Do you ever look at like when you're drafting in August in September or early September, Bob, and you're like, God, you know, I have, I have, I have a ton of this guy, but I drafted him in the tenth round yep. back in March. Now he's going in the seventh round. D do I really want to get yep. more shares of him in August, September? How do you handle that? So there's a point where you have to shift from best ball mindset to redraft mindset, mm -hmm. and you've got to disconnect the two. Otherwise, you know, use the best ball to inform where you want to pick, how your strategies lay out, kind of what your general approaches are. But you've got to disconnect from that mindset of, oh, I'm a little overweight on this guy. We all get to that point where you're yep. in enough drafts to go, I've probably got enough of that guy. I'm going to pivot away and try a different thing. You have to dial that all back in. So that, to me, is the big challenge. And it takes a little bit of time when I try to make that shift in August. I'm saying, you know, like I'm playing best ball right up through the thing. But, you know, right now I'm starting two or three a week uh, yes. best balls. <laughs> and so, you know, by the time we get to the season, I'm going to have – a lot of shares of, of players and some of them are uh, i'm looking at you anthony richardson some of them i'm going to have a whole <laughs> lot of and by the time i get the regular season you you know divorcing that from your process when you're getting the redrafts because look i'll still want some anthony richardson but that eight million shares i already have i need to set aside a little bit and, and that can be difficult mentally i think the uh, the thing i always run into uh especially in early may bob is i am like rookie fever right because i got all my rookie drafts for dynasty going on yep and i'm drafting all these rookies and then you try to make that shift to redraft and how do you how do you prevent guys like you know players we're going to talk about tonight, Ray Davis or Jalen Wright. How do you prevent them from rising too far up in your rankings? That's a challenge for me every single year. Uh, we may get into that. We may not, but I do want to talk about the Raiders here for, for a second. Okay. Paul Gutierrez, who covers the Raiders for ESPN.com, said that the Raiders owner, Mark Davis, has given his blessing for the team to make a move for a quarterback. Now, that came out, I think, earlier this morning. However, Jordan Reed, the colleague of Paul Gutierrez over at ESPN, said that the Raiders are shifting their focus away from quarterbacks and are going to try to fill uh, needs at offensive tackle and cornerback in this draft. Now, let's say for the sake of conversation here, the Raiders do want to make a move at quarterback. If they do, how much of a bump does Devontae Adams get if Michael Penix is their quarterback this year? How much of a bump does Michael Mayer get if Bo Nix is their quarterback? I don't think they're going to get one of the top four guys, but they could, get a, uh, they could get the fifth guy. They could get the sixth guy. If they don't, is there a significant distance between the fantasy outcomes <clears throat> for the players I mentioned? And we'll throw Jacoby Myers in there as well. If they do have a guy like Penix or Knicks, who granted doesn't have the experience of Gardner Minshew, but has definitely, a, at least what we perceive right now, a higher ceiling, Bob. I think we're bearing the lead here, Eric. It's Aiden O'Connell is the quarterback, of course. Antonio Pierce told us so. Yeah, okay. no question. So that aside, that's not like no, but it's so funny because I had a Hondo Carpenter from SI on my radio program on Sirius, to, and he says, man, if Antonio Pierce says it, you better believe that he means it. And I said, well, I believe he means it, but nobody else does, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just go into the draft rooms and you can see, uh, and like nobody thinks it's going to be Gardner Minshew either for that matter. That, but, uh, but, but yeah, I saw like uh, – I do think, like, I would love to see them get a quarterback. I know Penix is kind of getting a little buzzy, and mm -hmm. and that's, you know, generating some interest. Uh, again, you know, my buddy Matt Walbin, very high on him, has him ranked highly on his list. And so I find that very intriguing. I think he seems like a really polarizing character. But in general, you know, Devontae Adams already going is like, I want to say, tail end of the wide receiver ones. I have a lot of him uh, because I'm getting him as maybe a wide receiver too. If people are dialing back a little bit, <clears throat> here's the thing. They get a, they get a legit quarterback. 
he's moving back ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr., who he is going after right now, which I think is like super interesting how early uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going. All the top guys, neighbors and and uh, Roma Dunsey as well, all going at really reasonable prices. I'm not against it. I have many shares. Uh, but Adams, I mean, for, to me, one of the best receivers in the game for sure. Get him a competent court. Hell, without a competent quarterback, he's still very good. I mean, we saw O'Connell just like light him up at least one week, one game. So, uh, so yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful they do make a move at quarterback and uh, and inflate the uh, shares that I already have of Devonte Adams. Regardless, if they get a quarterback, and, and we'll we'll step out on Michael Mayer here for a second. Regardless, let's just say it's Minshew or O'Connell or whoever. Um, do you expect Mayer to make a leap from? <clears throat> what he did his rookie year to his sophomore year, just based on like, look, we normally see this from tight ends. Uh, is it a bigger leap than normal? Do you not see a leap? How do you feel about Michael Mayer heading into uh, year two? I do see a leap. Like, you know, every year we go in and say, well, I'll just stream tight ends. Well, okay, you and everybody else, right? Go right. ahead. <clears throat> but you look at the list this year, and it thins out really quick once you get past. I want to say, you know, I guess I get you, you 10. There's still a handful of guys there. But, boy, once you get outside the top 12, I guess – Man, it thins out quick. So guys like Mayer, I'm gonna have I have a lot of shares of him as mm -hmm. as my tight end too, a ton of shares, hoping he can turn into the thing they draft him to be, the thing he was projected to be last year. And like not everyone is Sam Laporta, apparently, or soon to be Brock Bowers, apparently. <laughs> uh, from everything I heard, like I'm, I'm wish casting here a little bit, Eric. Um, but 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 I do think he is a guy that's on my. There's a couple of tight ends that I'm getting late that are on my radar. Mayer is one, and Johnu Smith is the other. Because every piece I can get, cheap piece I can get of a Miami Dolphins offense, I'm all about. We have a situation where we can talk about a matchup here. Week one, uh, Packers, Eagles in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Going to be interesting because, uh, Bob, these are two – well, we already knew the Eagles were a high-flying offense. Um, they won't have Jason Kelsey this coming year. He's retired. But it <clears> seems <throat> like the band, for lack of a better term, will be back. Brown, we think, is good. Smith, yeah, Goddard, Okay. Uh, and, and then obviously, uh, the addition of Saquon Barkley, um, and Jalen hurts green Bay looked really, really good. The second half, or at least the last month and a half sure. of the season with all those receivers, no Aaron Jones, but they do have Josh Jacobs, Bob, this could be a, and the Eagles defense wasn't great last year. We'll see what they do in the draft. Um, the Packers defense, I, I would never say is like a world beater either. This could be one of those games, uh, Friday night of week one, where you're looking at a total of like. I don't know, the better part of 50, 47, 48. Like, this could be a really, really fun sure. game. I don't necessarily know if there's anything we could take away for fantasy, just that we're really excited to see these two offenses go at it. Totally. I think this is a great setup. Like, I know we got a new coordinator, you know, in, in Green Bay, and hopefully they can fix that defense to some degree. Oh, but not that fast. Right? Like, oh. <laughs> um, open, it, open to a huge week one. I think Cam Jurgens will figure it out for Jason Kelsey. Like, I think, you know <clears> – <throat> The, the Eagles are funny because people are going to have a bad perception. Like, you know, we remember the last thing we saw. The last thing we saw was that it seemed like a little bit dysfunctional mm -hmm. or at least from the outside we thought it was. I don't know, you know, A.J. Brown, if you want to put much stock in what he's saying, I'll go ahead and do that and say maybe the things on the outside aren't how they are on the inside. So we'll see. <clears throat> but either way, with the offensive skill weapons, uh, skill players we'll be seeing in this game, uh, can't wait. DFS uh, beauty uh, night one of the NFL. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And that's, I mean, like, we're going to have the Chiefs playing somebody the night before. Yeah, Thursday. And yeah, and then obviously a big, big game on Sunday. And then, I don't know, are we going to get two games on Monday night? It seemed like. I think we, we had, have been. We always have been. So, uh, the, the big question, Derek, is, is how long until we have football every single day of the week? <laughs> exactly. Well, and you know what's crazy is, like, and I don't want to get down this rabbit hole, whatever, but, like, during COVID, we saw Tuesday we saw football. It. Yep. Um, they've already announced this year, the NFL, they're playing football on Wednesday with yep. Christmas day. And as, as like, <clears throat> there is so, there is something to be said about too much of a good thing. And while yes. in theory, I would love to see the NFL each and every single day of the week. I don't know if that's good. It's, long -term. I don't either. You know, and the funny thing about football is one of the reasons that I was attracted or I felt football was so ideal for fantasy is that weekly drumbeat, right? Mm -hmm. You have this schedule of, 
okay, Monday's off. Tuesday, we get a feel for what guys are starting to do. Yeah. Wednesday, we get an injury report. Thursday, they do this. Friday, they do that. And it is like a buildup, the, you know, that weekly drum beat. And, you know, unlike baseball where I don't know, there's so many damn games, I don't even know when they're playing. <laughs> uh, and I don't watch it anyway. But but you get my point. It's, it's yeah. just like, seemed like football was this thing that's ideally set up for the fantasy game, the weekly thing. And and now it's getting a little bit a little bit wonkier with uh, with all the days. Well, and the, the thing that irritates me is like for fantasy standpoint, like you're talking about waiver runs on Wednesdays, then waiver runs either on Saturday nights right. or Sunday mornings. And then like if players Hard are decisions, playing, yes, because you don't, it's, it's a, it's a lesser player. Pool. Right. So then it's like, if you're blind bidding on it, do I need to go heavier mm. on this guy? Because not a lot of people are, or not a lot of other players are out there that could fit this need for me. Do you week. play the sure thing on Thursday versus the guy that's a little nicked up on Sunday? You know, those are more of those decisions too. That's horrible. Dom Gazzetti in the YouTube chat says, don't be ridiculous. We'd welcome uh, Balky from Perfect Strangers. Don't be ridiculous. We'd welcome an <laughs> NFL game every day. Yes, in theory, I would, Dom. But I think uh, once, right. what, like once I'm actually living it, I'm like, ah, this isn't great. Um, the last thing I want to get to here in this segment of uh, Russell Wilson is appar uh, apparently, yes, he is going to have the pole position, according to Mike Tomlin, to open the year as the starting quarterback this after they traded for Justin Fields. Um, I know you've done extensive research on this after the announcement of Wilson signing this deal with Pittsburgh. Um, best ball is how I want to center this because mm -hmm. I think this is the most fascinating thing. If you are drafting a best ball team, um, you want to make sure that you're getting the maximized points for the for the course of the season. Russell Wilson, yeah, he probably is the starter. Does he end as the starter? When does Fields take over, or does Fields even take <clears throat> over? How are you handling this in your best ball league? Uh, with a 10-foot pole for the most part, <laughs> but I uh, wouldn't touch him with yours, Eric. Uh, right. But the, the uh, like, especially like in Superflex and things like that, I mean, th that's probably the more likely time I'll get some Justin Fields as a – quarterback three or maybe four if it's really late and I feel like I need you know I have a little bit of risk ahead of them and I'm taking some chances you know like I think in most leagues what do I want from my quarterback two or even in super flex quarterback three I want job security right like so there's a there's a hierarchy of guys like probably Bryce Young is going to be a quarterback three on a lot of my teams before one of those Steeler quarterbacks because I just I don't know I know you listen to Cecil Lammy, he will tell you Russell Wilson will not be good uh, yes. because he's no longer that, right? And I think, you know, we obviously we've seen, you know, signs of it. Is that a, a permanent condition or was it, you know, a, a situation due to circumstance? You know, again, it's not cost prohibitive to find out, but, you know, and there, look, there's lots of quarterback twos out there, you know, that you're, you know, super competent players. And I think that's the thing that keeps me away from those guys is the list of players that I can get really late, like including Aaron Rodgers, including Matthew Stafford. I mean, there's so many players I can get, you know, well into the quarterback two range that I feel like have good job security and maybe a lot more upside than either of those Steelers. Like I'm interested in Justin Fields if he plays just because of the rushing equity, uh, probably less so in Russell Wilson. It's almost like a luxury pick, right? Because right. I, I wouldn't want either one of these as my second quarterback uh, when I could get no. you know, some of the guys you mentioned and then the other guys that are going ahead of them, Derek Carr, uh, Will Levis, Geno sure. Smith, all Baker those guys, all, you know, all of them. And what's wild to me is Fields is actually quarterback <clears throat> 27 and Russell Wilson's quarterback 30. Yeah. So Wilson's actually going behind Fields, which just means stay away unless you need a quarterback late. Right. I, I just want to say, uh, I, you know, some of those guys that you mentioned, like I, I do feel like, like Geno Smith, I'm probably, you know, I'm not 100% sold on him holding yeah. on to that job, you know, and Daniel Jones, not 100% on him being ready sure. or holding the job. So mm -hmm. there's a handful of guys that all, you know, Baker Mayfield looks pretty damn good at, at that point, right? And Stafford and Rodgers. I mean, Deshaun Watson, like, look, I don't know. You know, I'm a guy who's still waiting for 2013 Josh Gordon to walk in the door. It's not happening. <laughs> I don't know that, you know, Houston Deshaun Watson is ever walking back in the door right. either, but... I think it's a, not like not unreasonable to take a chance on that at this point. I uh, I I think once you it it kind of depends upon how you handle quarterbacks right. in your best ball drafts too. And obviously, if you're drafting, you know, one of the elite guys like the, the Allens, the Hurts, the Jacksons of the world, whatever, this becomes less of a problem. But if you're waiting 
and you're drafting <clears> Brock <throat> Purdy or Caleb Williams as your starting quarter or your top yep. quarterback, then this becomes more of an issue that you need to figure Very out. Right. We're, we're figuring out a ton of issues on the show. We're going to step out and take a, a quick break. When we come back, we're going to find out where Bob Harris stands on a lot of the new players in new situations. We're going to talk about Derrick Henry. Uh, Raheem Mostert just upped a new contract in Miami. How does this affect Achan and Mostert? Let's get into Travis Etienne. Let's talk about that Bills uh, Texans trade as well. He's Bob Harris, the football diehard on X from footballguys.com. I'm Eric Balkman from the FFPC. Don't go anywhere. We roll on right after this. The thing with Dynasty is that it's so hard to get a good league going. Like it's very difficult to get all these friends that are going to be paying attention or they're going to stick with it and they're not going to say, oh, I don't want to play anymore. My team stinks. I'll find somebody else next year. Like, and, and then you're collecting dues and then you're getting in arguments and you're arguing with people on Twitter about dues. Like, we've seen too much of that going on. So it's it's very difficult. And what happens is you find like five or six good people that want to play and then, you, and then you don't have enough people and you fill the league with a bunch of weirdos. So what I like doing, honestly, at this stage is if I'm going to play Dynasty, I want to play on a nice, clean, serious, professional site, and I go to FFPC to play, right? FFPC has never had a league fold. Eric Bachman over there told me that. He's like, we just, if somebody has to leave a league, we just fill it. So your option is you can go and do a startup and like, uh, you know, like Jack said in the chat, you, you start it and then you go and you, uh, you, you figure out who you're gonna take from the top down. And if you, you wanna do like a long rebuild, or you know, a, a long-term team, or if you want to try and win right away and get a bunch of bets, you can do that, or you can adopt an orphan team. And with that, you go out and somebody quit, and you and that's so much fun because then you you take their team and you you have all these guys that you like, but then you have all of these guys that they had that you don't like, and that's actually way more fun because then you can trade all those guys, and it's so much fun to trade. Like when I go to orphan teams, I used to say, oh, I'm not gonna take this team because all the players, I don't like them. I only want players I do like, but I've realized that it's actually more fun to take the teams that have a couple guys you really like and a couple guys that everyone else likes that you don't like and then trade them. Like go and grab an orphan team like Gabe Davis and then trade him to some Gabe Davis guy. So go do that now. Use the, uh, you can use a, the QR code here or a link in the description or go to myffpc.com. Just make sure you use promo code COOP when you get set up. They'll give you 25 bucks when you deposit 35 or more. And that's another thing. when you. When you make a league with your friends, Coop isn't giving you 25 bucks, right? You have to you have to pay the full dues. This time you get a little discount. So yeah, go over there. And, and also for you maniacs out there, they do have high stakes leagues. So these leagues, if you want, you can go big time. I know some of the redraft leagues, I, we, we announced on this channel a redraft league that 10K buy-in. I'm not sure the dynasty ones go that high, but they go into the thousands. So if you want to take this real seriously and get crazy with it, do it. That's the place to do it. MyFFPC.com. Promo code COOP, baby. Go get set up. As our good buddy Andrew Cooper from the Fantasy Alarm at BSN just pointed out, uh, plenty of dynasty action over at myffpc.com. We've still got, I don't know, I want to say about four dozen orphans to go um, that are going fast. So we do have dynasty startups going off at the $100 level all the way up to the $5,000 level. If you want to get in on that, go to myffpc.com, myffpc.com. Bob Harris joining me tonight on consignment from Football Guys, the football diehard at Football Diehard on X, uh, a guy who has been doing, you know, the other thing, Bob, and I, I didn't, I, I kind of gave you a short shrift at the top of the show. You're doing podcasts, you're guesting on other podcasts, guesting on other shows like this one, which thank you so much that you're doing this. You're on Sirius XM. You're doing all this stuff for football guys, churning out um, kind of weekly recaps of everything going on there in video portion, in like a video portion. And then you also do uh, the football guys um, a daily newsletter. You're giving your takes in there as well. The question for me is not what are you doing, Bob? It's what aren't you doing at this point? Because you're living and breathing it, man. Well, I mean, this has been the soul living since 1993. Uh, I think if I go another 10 years, I will break even. Uh, so looking <laughs> forward to that moment. Um, as we all know in this business, there's a bit of a grind early on. Mm -hmm. Like we all do it. But but yeah, I think it's, you know, like I can't imagine, you know, you sit here and you think of all the things you could be doing with your life. And, and here I am, work is play. 
Yeah. I mean, what else, you know, what more could I ask? I, you know, I love everything about it. I love the game, the hobby. I like, you know, creating the narratives, building the stories, telling stories. I mean, and that's what to me, fantasy football is. What are we doing when we're drafting? Well, we're telling ourselves happy stories about players we want to pick. We're telling us uh, other, you know, less happy stories about players we don't want to pick. And, <clears throat> and part of that is being ready to abandon our own carefully crafted narratives when it's time to abandon them, right? Like, oh, <laughs> bail, bail, uh, this not, this was not working, you know? So like we come in with super hard opinions and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. The better fantasy players are the people who acknowledge quickly that, hey, this isn't working out. Doesn't mean you have to abandon a player, but it means you have to abandon the approach and maybe you have to go with a different player. I mean, if people were playing Stefan Diggs last year uh, down the stretch, they were only playing him because his name is Stefan Diggs. You know, you have to be yeah. ready to acknowledge, hey, this guy's not getting the job done. I did it with Bloom and I had a big discussion about this last December, and I'm saying you can't play him right now. Right. And I know that's a hard decision to make because why FOMO? We're going to miss out on that big game. The minute I sit this guy down, he's going to have the big game. Well, maybe. <laughs> but also, while he is not having great games, there are other guys on your roster having great games. And I think that's the, to me, the hardest thing about fantasy is like, when do I when do I divorce myself from my narrative? When do I tell my, you know, when do I acknowledge my happy story is not coming true? I need to figure something else out. And the people who are good at that are the people who are good at fantasy football. I attribute learning that in the in fantasy football to you, Bob. This this is something I, I remember. You're the first person I ever remember saying this. And it's so true. Divorce the name from, from the, the number. numbers. Yep. Right. And and like and, and it's helped me so many times. Um, we have uh, your colleague Joey Wright from Football Guys popping in right now. It's insane how welcoming Bob Harris is to newcomers while juggling 99 <laughs> tasks and rolls. I Quite frankly, I don't know how you do this. Like, not only are you, like, popping in on everybody's shows and podcasts, sometimes I get a tweet and, like, hey, Balky, who am I starting this week? Am I going with uh, – with am I am, am I sitting um you know Marquise Brown in in favor of uh Jordan Addison whatever and like I'm like oh god now I gotta answer this and I still do like I, right. I, I take it as a privilege to do it but like I it just it's a chore to me that it's not a chore to you I mean you're you're <clears throat> it's a joy for you I you know I, I'm just at a point where like I feel like so fortunate to be part of this world right and that to have the attention of people like you know, Joe Bryant and I kind of joke around a little bit. Joe will say, you know, I don't know if I could get a job at my own site right now is what he was telling me. <laughs> I feel like, you know, we kind of got, I kind of got grandfathered into a situation. I, I don't know that I'm smart enough to make my way into this industry as it stands now. There are so many super high-end thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, people that are really good at the numbers and the data, all these things that, that it, to me, it's like a higher bar to hurdle. So, like, you know, the, the old Chris Collins were like, I'm just happy to be here, right? Like, I mean, you know, I am happy to be here. I think I owe a little bit something to, uh, you know, to a world where, you know, I've happily been working for the last 30 mm -hmm. years. And, and I mean, and that's part of the joy is it is, you know, the connections you make with people and the discussions you have. And like, it's funny because, you know, I'm not a hot take person. I'm not here to tell you like, you know, except for like, Jameer Gibbs last year and Anthony Richardson this year. Okay. There's like an hour every year that I'm like going to tell you that this is it. Right. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not that person who's out there telling you what to do. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Right. Like, and I think, you know, for, for this world, you know, if you're out there and you, you want to create content and get into this, the key is, you know, communicating your ideas, right? Like, you know, and that doesn't mean all your ideas have to be great, but you have to explain your ideas in a way that people can either find them useful and work them into their own approach or they say wow that's the way not to do this and not work them into approach right you can help everybody whether they agree with you or not and i think that's kind of the approach i try to take uh give my answers realizing that hey people it's your team you've got to make the final decision yeah. um i'm just going to tell you what i do why i do it and and then you get to make the call from there so i love that part of it i love the storytelling aspect of it the part where you get to sit there and and cobble together this narrative that mm -hmm. you know i mean you know and i I do it every year. There are a handful of players where I feel like I'm a little bit of an outlier. You have to come up with a with the reasoning behind that, and, and to me, that's the that's that's the part I love the most. I there, I have so many questions for you. We just don't have the time uh, on it tonight. But I, you're raising a lot of good points, a lot of points that I agree with too. <clears throat> over the course of my, not that I've been in the industry as long as you, because it hasn't been close. But I've been playing fantasy football right. since the early '90s, sure. right? And like stuff, you you adjust the stuff over the course of time. You you don't react the same way. You don't run your teams the same way. Right. 
in 2024 as you did in 2014 or 2004 mm-hmm. or 1994. Like right. it's totally different. And um, there's something I just, I, I do want to say, like you're sitting here and you're dealing with an audience that is looking at you as if, if it were not for a quirk of fate, they would be doing your job. Why? Because they do know as much as you. Mm-hmm. They are every bit as expert. They've been playing like, you know, people have been playing for as long as we've been playing. They know everything we know. We're not like reinventing the wheel for them. We're trying to help them. And most, you know, like most people, when you get questions, it's not about like, should I or shouldn't I? It's what do you think of me doing this? It's confirmation. Am I crazy to do this? Or, or you know, things like that. But, you know, you have to look at the audience with the with the, the respect that it deserves. Because they're all out there doing the same thing you're doing. They're playing like I know there are different levels of player and some of them need more assistance than others. But in general, we're delivering content to the best informed audience known to man. Right? Yeah. I mean, they're all they, I, I always say that, you know, the audience is the experts. My job is to help them get there. Right. Exactly. That's totally right. Well, Joe Bryan always calls himself a guide, right? right. He's just guiding sure. you. Like everybody at football guys. Um, yeah, Dom Gazzetti trying to break into the industry and now taking in your advice. So, Bob, thank you so much for that because I know that's going to help Dom going forward. I need to find out where you stand on certain players right now. And what I want to do is kick things off with a player that I had, quite frankly, kind of written off for Dynasty and Best Ball. And the more I think about this and read about this and listen to people talk about this, I realize, you know what? I, I can't be out on Derrick Henry just yet. Derrick Henry is now going as running back 10 right now in the FFPC best ball, uh, never too early drafts. A player that is now in Baltimore, Bob, who turned mm-hmm. Gus Edwards into a, a, a monolith last year. It was awesome, right? And now mm-hmm. a guy who has way more talent than Gus Edwards has is now in that backfield. Where do you stand on Derrick Henry? I'd like to see if you could answer this both in the form of redraft and dynasty, because I think dynasty is really compelling. Right. I think, you know, in dynasty, it's always, it's probably going to depend on, you know, where you're at in your cycle, right? If you're in win now, I want all of that, all of that, right? I think Derrick Henry is in a prime position. You mentioned it. Gus Edwards scored 13 touchdowns last year uh, in that offense in a part-time role. I'm guessing Derrick Henry will have a better role. And I think the people, you know, like I get it. He's old. He's 30. You are just turned 30. Right. He has a lot of carries. What does he have? Like, I, I want to say the, the the most rushing attempts in the NFL since 2018. So, yes, he's been busy. Also, still very fast. And I think that's, you know, I wrote about this last week. There's two things you can't coach in the NFL, size and speed. Derrick mm-hmm. Henry has more of both of those than pretty much everybody else in his position. He would have the sixth fastest speed in or seventh fastest speed in the NFL last year. He had 21, 60, what was it? One. Uh, 68, well, 21.68 miles per hour last year. That was the seventh fastest speed in the NFL. His breakaway runway run rate was sixth best in the NFL. He can still get away. And that's always been the thing that's different about him. A guy that big who's able to break away. He makes those tough decisions for defensive backs in the fourth quarter. Uh, those business decisions start coming, and that's when the path opens up. And then you add in a way better offensive line. Uh, they've done a little work in Baltimore. Uh, but, you know, comparatively speaking to what he was running behind at Tennessee last year, one of the worst run blocking units in the NFL. And you pair him up with the most dangerous running quarterback in the NFL, Lamar Jackson. They say they're not going to do a lot of RPOs. I would love to see more. I would love to see the uh, decisions that the opponents have to make at the mesh point when it's Lamar Jackson, Jackson and uh, Derrick Henry. But I think, you know, the price is starting to rise. I love getting him in the fourth, fifth round. I was taking kind of speculative shares before he landed in Baltimore on the hope, trying to speak it into existence that he would end up there. I thought he would end up in a good spot no matter what. Uh, This seems to me to be the ideal spot. So all in on him in redraft at his current price. I think that's still good. And it may go up as we get closer to the season and more people kind of catch on to what's going on. But in Dynasty, I think like if you're in win now mode, I'd be out there trying to buy him from somebody who's not. It's it's weird that uh, by the way I, and and I'm totally with you on Henry like now if if you are in when now Henry could put up top five numbers this year and it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, <clears throat> the the Miami Dolphins running back situation is interesting. Raheem Mostert ends up re upping on an extension uh, for a contract that uh, will now keep him in the fold through uh, 2024. Now last year, just over a thousand yards. 18 touchdowns on the ground. I think he had like 20 or 21 overall. Um, Mostert is, this isn't the exact kind of allegory I want to make, but there was a quote in in, um, Talladega Nights, Will Ferrell, Sasha Barrett Cohen, where Sasha Barrett Cohen is trying to get Will Ferrell's Ricky Bobby. He needs him to 
to be his rival, to ultimately beat him so he can retire. That's not the situation with Mostert and no. Achan. But to borrow the quote, the Beatles needed the Rolling Stones. Diane Sawyer needed Katie Couric. Devon Achan needs Raheem Mostert. Raheem Mostert needs Devon Achan. I love seeing this. I love seeing that the fact that these guys are going to be back together in Mike McDaniel's offense, which puts a huge emphasis on speed, which both of these players have, and both of these players were a little bit nicked up last year. I don't want either one of them ever becoming the three down feature <laughs> no, back. I right, don't want right. them ever becoming it's not the necessary. Of, no, we don't want it because it'd be it'd be it'd be counterintuitive to how good they can be for fantasy. Now that they're locked in, at least as far as I could tell, locked in as the top two options for Miami. I really like both these players, not only for Dynasty in 2024, but for best ball as well, Bob. I like both of them better last year when I was getting them in, oh, right. I want to say, that's right, right, right. <laughs> like running back 48, running back 52. And 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 if I'm being honest, I had a lot of shares of Jeff Wilson as running back 59 or right. whatever. Yep. But <clears throat> like, so I think, I feel like, Devon A. Chan's being drafted wrong. He's like been running back eight, and you know I've seen him as high as running back eight. I think that's a little steep given what my anticipation. But but also like I'm not against it. I have some of those shares. I'll have more shares of Mostert in round eight than I do of Devon A. Chan as running back eight mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But I think you you nailed it right. And, and I want to say I talk about those speeds because I think in the NFL that is like such a critical aspect, especially in an offense the way Mike McDaniel runs it. Waldman will talk about this a little bit and say it's kind of like they're what they're designing are kick returns for super fast guys. Like every play is designed as like to turn into a kick return where yeah. these guys are just getting the ball in open space and doing their thing. I talked about the speeds for Henry. It was 21.68. Hey, Chad, or was that like, let's see. I'm going to look at the speeds here. Um, next gen stats. 21.62 miles an hour for Mostert on a 43 yard run. Chan hit 21.93. Tyree Kill topped out at 22.01. That's less than a half mile per hour difference. But what does that mean? It means nobody's catching any of these guys from behind. So whoever you have, go ahead and feel free. I thought the Jordan Rodriguez article on The Athletic talking about the Miami offense, how they're putting guys in motion, getting them running at speed before they get the ball in their hands against defenders who are standing flat-footed is like this is what makes the this is the secret sauce for this Miami yeah. offense from a fantasy perspective. Now, like I'm not gonna bank on you know Mostert getting another 21 touchdowns or running for 18 or whatever. Um, and he is older, but his mileage is low, his carries are far below usually guys at his age. I want to think he has 645 career attempts. 26 running backs have at least a thousand attempts since Mostert entered the league, uh, the year in what 2015. Yeah. So, so like, it's not like he's been overwhelmed. He's a super nice guy too. When you talk to him, I love chatting with him. He's a, a surfer, almost went into professional surfing. Really? When he was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Had, had sponsorships and everything, billabong, all, you know, the whole nine yards. But uh, I just think he's in a great spot. I think the price is right for him. Again, not like avoiding HN at, at cost, but not getting as much of him as I am going to get a uh, motion later. And also, when you're talking about free squares, I mean, you know, Christopher Brooks, just keep that name in the back of your head, back of your head. That's what uh, Ricardo Martinez, who's watching us on YouTube right now, is chiming in. He's saying most are, he's totally agreeing with you, Bob. Most are better value, uh, but don't forget about Brooks. Don't forget about Jeff Wilson. Either one of them could yep. be this year's most. Totally true. And, and, and they're basically free right now. I mean, you can yep. get them super cheap uh, right now in drafts too. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to just point out, and um, you talk about the speed. Um, you've said more than once tonight, getting these guys, these really fast guys going downfield against flat-footed defenders. And to the casual fan, casual sports fan, or maybe even casual fantasy football fan, they'll say, well, I mean, how much of a difference does that make? Well, <laughs> there is such a fine line between winning and losing, being good and being bad, being mediocre <laughs> and being above average in the NFL, stuff like that. Like I, that, that is the non equalizer, right? That mm -hmm. is the separator stuff like that, because everything is so close. Normally right. when you have a situation like that, that can be a big difference. And, and I think that's what got me so excited about the dolphins offense in general last mm -hmm. year. And it's, what's getting me excited about them this year. Those are the differences. You nailed this. Like guys come from college and they're used to being, you know, in a 2% field and everyone else is maybe you know, within five to 10%. In the mm -hmm. NFL, everyone's in that same like two percentile, right? They're all there. The talent is there. The speed is all there. So when you can get guys and get a, you know, with that high end athleticism, but match them up with a scheme that maximizes that portion of their game, 
Again, that's the part you can't coach, the size right. and the speed. You, 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 you know, put your guys in position to make plays that have that super high in playmaking ability. I'm going to be looking for those kind of players all day long, and I'll, I'll overspend on them a little bit. Um, but but for the most part, some of them are very cheap, as as uh, as Raheem Mostert would like us to know. Yeah, and and that that's the other thing too. I mean, we talk about drafting injury away type running. I mean, Jordan McNamara, um, who uh, um, analysts at DynastyFootballGuys.com, he talks about this all the time. Getting these injury <laughs> one yep. injury away type guys, and like we can look at that, but we also should look at because because there's thing there's different things that make an injury away type guy. There are certain players on a depth chart where they're the backup or the third string, and you're like, they don't do anything special, you know? Like what? How does this right. guy win, right? And <clears> if they don't do anything special, it's kind of blasé. But if you get a super fast guy or a super strong guy or a guy who breaks a lot of tackles or a guy who has a nose for the end zone, like these are all kind of the traits that you're looking for when you get to the 14th, the 15th, the 16th round of your best ball drafts. That's what you should be focusing on. And the Dolphins have a few guys to focus on. Right. That's why we like to, you know, for a period, Alexander Madison behind Dalvin Cook. We assume yes. he's a plug and play threat, a guy that's going to come in and get that same workload and maybe have the opportunity to do similar things with it. Those are the kind of players, like when you're looking for your insurance policies or your your players to pair with other players. Not all, not all, not all handcuffs are equal, right? Not all guys are going to come in and have that same role. Sometimes they have to cobble it together. And those are the guys probably you want to shy away from but look for those guys that are the one for one or capable of providing that one for one replacement at least in terms of volume volume is king eric right that's yeah that's the thing that like uh, especially in an L nfl that that where the league is getting its way the volatility is off the charts i know we say every year like oh there's more injuries well last year there was fewer injuries it was like way down but the volatility last year seemed like the most volatile you never knew what was going to happen to any given weekend and i think that's you know how the nfl wants to design so what are the things that i can bank on I can bank on Christian McCaffrey getting a lot of touches, right? Or, you know, players that I know are going to be high volume plays. Uh, those are the kind of guys that I want to get a lot of, especially the super athletic ones at the high end of the, of the game. Yeah. I mean, it seems like simple, right? Like elite <clears throat> talent and volume, right? Brees Hall. Brees Hall. <laughs> yeah, like get McCaffrey, get them both McCaffrey, together. Right. Right. Um, so it seems it's, it, and sometimes I think we outthink ourselves, but that's what we should we always do. be focusing on. In drafts, um, mm -hmm. Ricardo Martinez. Uh, well, I want to get to the Chuba Hubbard thing coming up later on in the second hour. We'll touch on that in a little bit. I do want to get your thoughts on let's do Zamir White here first. Um, I was pretty excited. I have a few shares of Zamir White and Dynasty. And when I saw the Raiders sign Alexander Madison to back him up, I thought, okay, this is this is a good vote of confidence in Huge Zamir White, confidence. right? And and so I see that and I'm like, okay, this is I can count on White as like maybe a second or a third running back this year and I feel pretty good about it. Am I right in thinking that, Bob, or do I still have to sweat out the draft for the Raiders? <clears throat> you are correct, sir. Uh, <laughs> number one, Luke Gessie shows up, one of the run heaviest play callers in the league the last couple of years in Chicago. I know, you know, I thought it was interesting. Antonio Pierce wants his team to score 24 points a game. Right. And then you bring in Getsy and you still want to be run heavy. Well, <clears throat> I think they they kind of foreshadowed what we're going to see. We, uh, we saw Zamir White getting 114 yards from scrimmage over the final four games last season. It's just basically a plug and play, a one for one replacement for Josh Jacobs. Maybe not with the receiving ability. Jacobs is a better receiver than I think we give him credit for. <clears throat> but the volume is going to be there. And it's not just not just Pierce, it's Tom Fulesco, the GM, wants to have a, a run-heavy approach as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm really bullish, and I think I've been seeing Zamir White going as running back 30 or later in the best balls I've been in, and that means I have a lot of Zamir White. I, uh, I I wish I had more mm. at this point. Like, and and we'll see what happens in the draft. I think the I price think is going to rise as people start to you know, totally yeah. will. Yeah, this is this is one of the things. Like, and I think it's interesting too. Like come out of every season where the memories are fresh in our mind. The lessons we learned are fresh in our mind. And you see people drafting in early drafts like, yes, I learned those lessons. And then as we get closer to the season, everyone crawls back into their little defensive shells and goes back into the way they've always drafted. <laughs> and uh, you end up, you know, or they fall back onto players that they've leaned on in the past instead of, you know, moving on and trying new things. So I think we'll see, you know, more Derrick Henry later as the year progresses. We'll see that price rise. We'll see the mere prices white's price rise and, and more players like that as well you had some interesting thoughts on travis etn to to keep uh hey. it going with running backs here travis etn right now ffpc best ball tournament running back 11 at the 304 <clears throat> are we taking him at the right spot are we taking him too early bob 
I I think it's the pro I think it's defensible, right? Because uh, you know, until we see Tank Bigsby turn into the thing that we've all been told he's going to be, and like you know, like I like I I touted him last year as that guy that was going to have a role. I think the Jaguars. I did that because the Jaguars thought he was going to have that role. The ball security was a problem, and he didn't show up. And so we end up with ETN, 325 total touches. That's up from 255 the year before. I don't think they want that. That ranked third. That was behind uh, Chris McCaffrey and Rashad White, who were the only two players with more touches last year. I think they would like ETN not to have that many touches. Uh, and I think they'd like Tank Bigsby, or maybe they draft someone. Maybe they don't. Maybe it's not Tank Bigsby. Maybe we find out. They want somebody to cut into his workload. Could it be addition by subtraction for Travis ETN? You know, a fresher, not getting the work, you know, the kind of pounding he got. I don't know that he's built for that kind of pounding, right? Mm -hmm. To me, I watch him run kind of upright and I, you know, like, I think he's really good. I think the price is not bad. I have concerns that Doug Peterson is talking about lightening the workload. And, if, and, and, and that said, you know, you're not drafting him high up enough that you're worried about that super high end volume. But I would still like him to get the bulk of the volume. We'll see. I think that offense is going to be better. I think the offensive line, they're already – you know, they've done some work there. I think things will be better. I think Trevor Lawrence is a great rebound kind of player. One of those guys that you're getting in that, you know, tail end. I think quarterback 16, 17, maybe even right now. I mean, I think that's like not a, you know, I think he was believing he'll rebound depending on who they get a wide receiver. I uh, think that, but just from better pass protection alone, I think, I think there's room for improvement for this offense. Um, one other thing I want to weigh in on with, uh, and, and I want you to uh, go ahead with your Anthony Richardson stuff because ah. your Anthony Richardson take. Now, I'm not saying that you influenced an entire industry, but you may have been influenced an entire industry. Anthony Richardson back in mid January <laughs> was going as a late seventh round pick, sometimes slipping until the early eighth round. Um, as of right now, in the FFPC or uh, never too early best ball tournaments, this dude has ascended to quarterback six. Yep. He is going at the five, six turn. Yep. That is like, I mean, like three rounds of value, whatever that is, two rounds at <clears> least. <throat> um, he is moving up and the reports on him have been really, really good. People have been slow to react, but not you, Bob, you are taking advantage right now. I've been pushing this all along, right? Like, and I, I look at it as like, a, you know, if you're out buying lottery tickets and you're standing at the counter and you're looking at the scratch tickets and you say, uh, you say, I want one of those uh, $50,000 grand prizes. Or do you say, I want one of those million dollar grand prizes, right? <laughs> like, and you don't know if you're going to get the million dollars, but you'd like the shot at the million dollars. To me, Anthony Richardson, if you looked at how he played last year. Look, they, the Colts, here's, here's part of this. The Colts believe in him more than I do. That's that's a big part of this. Like so Chris Ballard will tell you, and and this again is another one Matt Waldman caught me on to last year, where you know everyone viewed him as not a great passer. Maybe we were looking at him wrong. The Colts certainly look at him differently. And you look at the newsroom, Zach Kruger over at NBC at Roto World uh, put up an interesting number. It was like a 64, 66 percent pass rate on neutral plays, right? So it wasn't like they were sticking on the ground or he was running heavily. He was throwing the ball plenty. So I just think we're maybe viewing him a little wrong. He does have the high-end athleticism. They need to keep him healthy. And I will get up on my soapbox right now and start pounding the table and telling every NFL team, when you invest in a quarterback, also do the thing the Miami did. We should all be copying the Miami Dolphins. Put some effort into keeping your quarterback healthy. Yeah. The Dolphins, you know, Tua does the jujitsu and the judo to, you know, learn how to fall. Also, I mean, like you see fighters get punched in the head all the time. People who know how to roll with blows, absorb punishment, do all those things for your quarterback to try and help them keep, stay healthy. Do a better job of play calling to try to help them stay healthy as well. Uh, but I think Anthony Richardson, you look at the size, the speed, the athleticism, the supporting cast around him. I think they built really well. And I think the way the Colts view him is part of this, right? They don't view him as a limited passer. They view him as a guy who can get the job done and make all the throws. We're going to find out. I'm willing to burn a draft pick at that point. But part of that is, Eric, that there are those. There are Aaron Rodgerses and Matthew Staffords. Or, I mean, if I want to go a little. And, and, like, I will do that. Like, if I'm going a little early on a, on Anthony Richardson, maybe I'll get a Jared Goff or, you know, I'll, I'll rise up a little bit into closer into the, maybe inside the double digit routes. But also there are plenty of guys outside the double digit routes that I would feel comfortable with as my quarterback too. I mean, Kirk Cousins, I have so many pre Atlanta Falcon shares of Kirk Cousins as my two to Richardson's one that I feel super good about it. Right. And that's, that's it. You know, again, you can have 
uh, you know, risk on your roster without having a risky roster, right? Build in yeah. some pieces that help you mitigate that risk, or at least that you that give you the chance to mitigate that risk. And yes, I am all in on Anthony Richardson. Uh, I think I wrote today, uh, I might not be the engineer on the hype train, but I am the conductor. So all aboard. <laughs> yeah. You're the, you're the people, you're the one in, in charge of letting people on and off. So yeah, clearly you are, you are the, uh, you're the gatekeeper. Um, I remember in high stakes drafts last year where Richardson as a rookie was going as that quarterback 11 through 13 yep. or whatever. And, and now this year quarterback six, I mean, when you could, when you consider the context of it, doesn't seem all that weird, right? To see no. Richardson going that high, and he certainly uh, did nothing to this. The only thing that was an issue was the injuries, because everything on the field, he was awesome. Yeah, the and point he should... totals he put up in the games he was healthy were were phenomenal, and you yeah. know, and some of that came on the run, but some of it came on the pass as well. And I think that's the thing. Also, let's say he wasn't these wasn't or isn't the best passer, and he has some has a need to get better. Well, it's not like that doesn't happen," said Josh Allen. Mm -hmm. who came into the league with the reputation of not being able to hit the broadside of a barn, but who now hits the backside of a shoulder like it was a, a you know, the, the broadside yeah. of a barn, right? So, sniper, absolutely. Right. Um, I, I think, um, and speaking of Josh Allen, here's what, let's, let's do this. We have not gotten into the Bills-Texans trade. I do want to get I, your thoughts on that. I do want to talk a little bit uh, about some rookies here coming up. Marshawn Lloyd, Keon Coleman, I definitely want to hit on them. I also want to get your opinion on Brock Bowers and the Dallas Cowboys running back situation. So we'll step out just for a real quick minute. This is the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show on the Better Sports Network. He's Bob Harris from Football Guys. I'm Eric Balkman from the FFPC. We roll on next. Never Too Early Best Ball Tournament is already open right now over at FFPC. Uh, drafts are available daily, two-hour clock or six-hour clock, or you know the sit-and-go 30, second clock if you really just want to bang out a draft. Uh, those are scheduled in advance, so you can go get set up on that. Take a shot, either uh, $25,000 or $10,000 grand prize. That's in the, bid, the Never Too Early Best Ball uh, contest. they got some big prizes over there, man. And you can play high-stakes games over there, too. So... Uh, you can hit this QR code that's right in front of my face or go to myffpc.com. Use promo code COOP, C-O-O-P. They'll give you 25 bucks off when you deposit $35 or more. So go get set up right now. We're doing, you know, we already do our dynasty. We do our redrafts over there. We do our high stakes stuff. But we do the playoff contest. We do it all. So I'm like, I'm going to get in on the best ball too. It's never, for me, whatever you got, whatever contest you got, I'm going to play. I'm going to win. That's it. So go over to myffpc.com, use promo code proof, and you can win as well. FFPC Empire Leagues are here. They are dynasty leagues with a large progressive prize pool that grows yearly. Only awarded once there is a back-to-back -back winner. When that happens, the back-to-back -back champion wins the M prize pool and the league disbands. That's at myffpc.com. Myffpc.com is where to go for your Empire League analysis. Where do you go for your football analysis? How about footballguys.com? How about Bob Harris at Football Die Hard on the X? Doing this longer than, I mean... When did, so Bob, when, what year was your very first fantasy football league? Was it 86? Did you say that? 1986 okay. uh, is what it was and a phenomenal thing. Uh, you know, it was so, it was so funny because a friend of ours, you know, yeah, your little group of guys that were, were all right. hung out together. And one of us went off to San Diego to do some work, came back and said, Hey you guys, found this thing. You're going to love it. <laughs> and, uh, and of course we did. Right. And then, I mean, it's just like, it's been, there's never been a time I haven't played since. I just keep adding more and more mm -hmm. and uh, play way too much. Although uh, hoping to fare a little better this year with the new role of football guys, might have a little more, a little more bandwidth to focus on my teams than I've had, you know? So uh, everyone who knows me from football diehards, uh, by the way, I mean, if you haven't heard what happened to Emil Cadlick, uh, yeah. uh, had a cancer diagnosis. He's retiring. He sold the company. You'll see a pro forecast magazine this year. Uh, so watch for that. But um, you know, hate the circumstances, but couldn't have found a better landing spot with people that I've known for 20 plus 25 plus years. And, you know, Joe Bryant I've helped me publish his first article on value-based drafting back in the late nineties in one of the magazines. So <clears throat> just like it worked out so well for me. So su feeling super fortunate for that as well. But, but also 
feeling super fortunate because of my 30 plus leagues, I will actually be able to spend a little more time uh, doing free right. agency and things like that, <laughs> which has been a bit of a weakness for me. I, I hear that all the time from volume players. Like, right. um, they're like, and I've done it myself. Like, I probably play in, I, it's usually around two dozen every single year. And it's always fun drafting. We love I drafting. Love but thank then you, you, best ball. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Th- thank you, best ball. Whoever invented that should, I, I think, Sigma. Uh, you know who invented that? Let me let me throw that out there for you. Yeah. It would be Emil Cadillac. He did. And Emil 19, did. Okay. 19, 1998, we were doing the Fanex leagues, uh, the the kind of an expert group of, you know, mm-hmm. so called experts. Uh, and we all wanted to fit in one more, but we didn't want to manage it. And so Emil came up with the idea. Let's do a set and forget kind of uh, league. And we did that. And uh, and uh, it's documented. You can go out and Google it. It was 1998. And uh, and uh, it's kind of grown since then. Yeah. Also, Emil starting the high stakes world as well. So right. yeah, a bit of an innovator in the space. That massive. And he, Hall of Famer, right? Right. Emil is a Hall Both of Famer. FSGA and FSWA. Yes. But he did, he did the double dip. Um, my mother, who is, and she's not watching this, so I can tell her real age. She <laughs> turns turned 71 this year, Bob. And she has never been interested in, like, I, I think I started playing fantasy baseball before football, probably in the early 90s. I, I started football quite a, a little bit after that. Ironically, I found out fantasy football. I bought a, um, uh, for my PC, um, I bought a computer game, uh, f- a, a football computer game. And in the back of this book, the manual that came with it was these was this thing called fantasy football. Hey, this is what you can do with real life. Right. And I'm like, oh my god, this sounds awesome. And I collected this. And nobody cares about this, but I'm going to share it anyway. I started collecting sports cards, baseball, football, basketball, what have you, in the late '80s. I quit in like for good, pretty much in the mid '90s when I was opened up to the world of <laughs> fantasy sports. Right. So I have like ten thousand cards at home. And maybe less than 1% of them is after 1995 because I just lost interest. And in I'm like, fantasy is so much better. <clears throat> right. Um, it, 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 it's, 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 it's been like, for, for me, I like, and I don't like any other sports. So it mm-hmm. works out really well. I'm mm-hmm. not, uh, you know, I don't have to watch any basketball. I do not watch any baseball. Uh, don't do a lot of things. I mean, the car race comes on, a UFC fight. Sure, I like uh, like the combat sports a little bit, but but football is the thing that I've always enjoyed, and in NFL more so than college. So I don't really watch a lot of college. I'm playing catch up on all the rookies. We're going to talk about some of them, and uh, fortunately, you know, the thing that amazes me is like all the cottage inter- industries that have risen up. Uh, around the NFL, one of them, you know, being the fantasy community, but also the draft community. And there, of course, yeah. there's, there's a little dovetailing there. Um, but all, but I mean, it's just amazing how these little niches grow up and you find all these amazing people who fill this void of information that you need. I, I want to uh, bring that point home about football because I still pay attention. Like, well, I mean, my, my baseball and basketball stuff, I'm in Wisconsin. So I follow okay. the Brewers. I follow the Bucks. Outside of that, it, it's tough for me. Football, yeah, I'm going to follow all 32 teams, right? Um, and and I think what's interesting is we had the bombshell of this Bills Texans trip, right. um, whatever it was. How how long ago was that? Now a week and a, a half week ago. Week. It was a week. It was the third. So so, so it's the height. It, it's the height a of, week and a of, day. of like everybody's talking about the national championship game for college basketball and opening day for baseball. And yet, what's dominating the headlines? Right. Stefan Diggs is a Texan. Oh my goodness. Mind blowing. And, and it, it, it's so crazy because I think that drives home the point of like, we are now in NFL country. Like it that is. is, that is our center <clears throat> focus. The and- NFL has created the ultimate 365 day reality show. And if you don't think part of this is by design, then you have not been paying attention to your calendar because as the Super Bowl ends, what begins? Oh, the dra- the combine. Mm-hmm. The combine rolls into free agency and the free agency rolls back into the draft and the draft rolls into OTAs and mini camps. Mini camps roll into training camp. You get a little hole there, maybe about a two, three week hole there in June, July. Uh, and then August, we got the preseason ramps up and then the regular season starts and we are into the playoffs and then we're into the Super Bowl. And then guess what? Here comes the scouting combine. It yep. does not stop. And it's dominant, right? The, 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 the aspects of the game, even the draft and things like that, or, or the combine, you know, the live broadcast, the multiple networks covering it. I mean, it gets the kind of coverage that, and it gets that coverage because people pay attention to it. And now as we see the proliferation of the streaming platforms getting involved, yes. who knows where it's all going to end up. Um, but I'm here for all of it, by golly, all 365 days a year, every damn year. Yeah, I, I can't get enough. And there's always another storyline. There's right. always something else to unpack. And I think this Houston, uh, let's it look is. at it from the Houston angle sure. here first, because 
Um, this changed ADP, Bob. Right. It changed ADP. 100%. <laughs> you had um, – now I'll tell you what they're what I'm seeing right now. So Nico Collins, wide receiver 13 at the 304. He is still going ahead of Stephon Diggs, wide receiver 20 at the <clears> 404. So about a round's worth of, uh, of, of draft picks between Collins and Diggs. Tank Dallas slipped to the 506. He's wide receiver mm. 26. And then you look at um, C.J. Stroud, single quarterback lead. He is now up to quarterback five in the mid fifth round. Right. Your thoughts on those draft values post Diggs trade for Houston? I think the Stroud juice is real and probably should be real, right? Like, and so the wide receivers, though, I don't think it's shaken out where it's going. I, I'm surprised that it hasn't moved faster. Uh, you know, all the shares that I have, Nico Collins, where you're getting them right at the tail end of the wide receiver ones, feels like I'm gonna wish I didn't have them at that price. And look, maybe maybe I'll be surprised. Every time I think about it, I think, oh, I think of him running past defenders and making great plays. And <laughs> and and but but you know, at some point, you know, having three really good players along with Dalton Schultz, so I won't throw him out of the window. And they bring in Joe Mixon as well. They, they like everything they're doing is they realize they have a talent in CJ Stroud. Uh, from a dynasty perspective, I know there was a lot of buzz on Twitter there a couple of days ago about him being dynasty quarterback. One, well, no, he's not. Uh, and and not because I don't think he's good, but just like he doesn't have the rushing equity to move up that high for me. Also, I have maybe a little concern that, that you know, like, okay, Bobby Slowick designed a great, you know, brought a great offense with him from San Francisco. I'm sure they could get someone else to run that scheme or a similar scheme, but I feel like Slowick is on the verge of moving on to bigger and better things mm. as a head coach. Got interviews this year. Uh, I think another successful, if Stroud continues to play successfully, I think that all but guarantees Bobby Slowick gets a job somewhere else. Does that have an impact on Stroud down the road? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Diggs is only around for one year, whatever the case. I think for this year, uh, the Stroud steam is is real and legitimate, and he's going where he should be going. And maybe maybe he should go a little higher. I don't know. I think the the lack of rushing equity is the thing that kind of keeps, I think, is a, a limiting factor for him. Uh, but between Diggs and, and and the thing, I and I'll ask you this, Eric, because I think this is the question I I was asking myself before this trade, like, in five years from now, when we're looking at Stefan Diggs, are we going to say, wow, remember that little like blip in his career where he kind of sucked for about 10 games and then he was great again? Or right. is that, is that, remember when he fell off the cliff during the 2030 season and, and never to be seen again? And so I'm curious which digs we get. I'm guessing he'll be a highly motivated digs. Looks like he can still play to me. Again, maybe we're assigning single variables to a multivariable equation. Uh, on him, like, oh, well, Joe Brady took over as offensive coordinator and then Diggs suck. Well, that was part of it for sure, but was that all of it? Uh, I don't know that we'll get the full story on that. A lot of rumors out there about, you know, the relationship with Josh Allen, you know, and and whatever, you know, was going on between them. And they seem so tight, right? Like, a couple of years ago, it seemed like they were best buds, inseparable, and apparently there, have, there has been some kind of division there. And so who knows? Diggs is, you know, it's interesting that Diggs has talked his way out of a lot of places as good as he is. Uh, so you need to keep him happy. Will he be happy in this offense? We'll find out. Right now, I'm going to draft a lot more Tank Dell than I am those other two, but I think the prices are going to normalize a little bit, and I think all three are going to be cheaper than they should be uh, by the time we get closer to the season, and I'll take my chances on all of them. You know, you know the thing you bring up with with Diggs and Allen, and and Cecil Lammy, has, has, he put this in my brain listening to him because I heard him mention this on more than one occasion, um, that there was this disconnect because – and, and I think like the normal, the normal reaction when we see something like this, where a team gives up on a, a, a diva, quote unquote, right. receiver like Diggs, is always the receiver. Um, you know, they're <laughs> look, they're eating thirty million dollars of of dead cap. Right. They obviously the want them off the most team. in the history of the game, the most ever for a non quarterback. Right, and and it's insane. But I remember Cecil saying several times that like there was. Um, and he would know the story better than me, but some, something to the effect of Josh Allen wasn't taking football as seriously right. as Stefan Diggs wanted him that to is. take it. So, so we don't want, I don't want to, I don't, I look at it from the standpoint, like, I don't want to necessarily think like this is all on Diggs. Maybe right. this was on Allen. Um, who is the guy uh, who covers the bills? And, and I'm blanking on it right now. Might've been Buscaglia who said that there was something that he didn't say anything about early in the season when there was this, kind of dust up after the bills <laughs> lost to the jets right. on monday night football where where uh Al, or alan's like relax it's one game and he only was saying it to Diggs, and then nothing else and 
who I, again, the, I don't know if it was Joe Biscaglia or whoever, but they said like, oh, I wish I would have made more of a, uh, uh, an issue about it at the time because I didn't realize this. So like, for me, I look at it from the standpoint, like, yeah, I mean, obviously you think, oh, Diggs is, is not necessarily washed, but he's on the downside of his career. He's going to another team that has two really capable pass catchers. Um, may, maybe this, this is it for Diggs and, and this is the, we already saw peak value. I'm not so sure. And, and right. I, I keep coming back to that aspect of it. Right. Like, and there are things like, you know, that you hear from reputable people that I would not repeat without seeing or knowing firsthand right. that these things happen. So I'm not going to repeat them, but it is interesting. And you see a player like Diggs who, who you know, like all these receivers have the same story. I just want to win. And yes. to them, winning means them being a big part of the offense. I don't know that they're necessarily wrong, right? Like it's a team sport, but when you have a star receiver, you should be maximizing his value. I do think, though, we'll find out this year a little more about Diggs. I think the, you know, if the price, if the, if the price right now, I have a lot of shares of Diggs at this price right now that he's been going. When he was a bill, he was still going right about this same price, right? Mm -hmm. You can get him third round. Uh, I have a lot of those uh, shares. I think it's still a reasonable price here. I do hope it drops a little bit and that I can reap a little bit of value. And maybe with that Stefan digs like upside that we've come to know in the past, I totally think it's still well within the, the range of possible outcomes is that he is still that guy. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's important to understand. Um, and, and let, let's flip it over to Diggs' old team with sure. Buffalo here, Josh Allen, Dalton Kincaid. Uh, there's been a, a, a more than a few smart people I've seen on X talking up Curtis Samuel as well. Sure. I think that what's interesting here is there is this uh, inclination that a lot of people just assume the bills are drafting a receiver and yeah, they probably will, but that draft pick they got in this trade was a 2025 right. pick not a 2024 pick. So it's not like they have this extra second round pick this year in a historic class. Keon Coleman receiver. better be really good. No. Okay. Well that, in, in, okay. See, you bring up Coleman and that's the, that's the name I always come back to with the bills. It like, it just, I keep coming back like Keon Coleman to Buffalo, Keon Coleman. So like when you're talking about drafting Josh Allen or Dalton Kincaid, do you have to just assume that Buffalo is going to have a day one or day two pass catcher on this squad to go along with not only those two, but Curtis Samuel as well? They will. I mean, I, I'm convinced they will have that. And, and maybe they'll they'll even move up and get somebody even better. Who knows? I mean, we'll mm -hmm. see what Brandon Bean ends up doing. He says he'll leave no stone unturned. Will he leave every draft pick unturned? We'll find out. Um, But to that notion, like, you know, for, first of all, Josh Allen was quarterback one in fantasy last year. Uh, he did that with Stephon Diggs averaging, what, 50 yards a game, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, like, does he need that guy? I don't know. Uh, the rushing equity is going to always help fuel him. And I know for every year that that I hear Josh Allen and the Bills say, we want you to run less. I want to run less. Also, there is no less running. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I don't expect there to, I don't expect there to, like, I mean, as a player gets older, and maybe we'll see that with Jalen Hurts as well, <clears throat> and maybe even Lamar Jackson at some point where they start dialing back in the running. But, uh, you know, two things. Uh, Josh Allen can still throw really well, and uh, and I think they can cobble together a receiving core, and we'll see about Curtis Samuel. I've kind of been, you know, like I'm not pushing it because I am not, not because the price is right. I mean, he, I have a lot of shares. I think a lot of people are really hooked into the Joe Brady portion of that narrative. The last mm -hmm. super high-end season that he had was with Joe Brady in Carolina. I think the I think the commanders had some plans for him based on that role that they were never quite able to get implemented, but they were trying to do the same thing. We'll see if the Bills can pull it off with Brady back in the helm. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's catch as catch can. I mean, I, I think the big winner of this, uh, you know, on the Bill side is Dalton Kincaid, who we heard the talk when they drafted him last year. Here's your Travis Kelsey like weapon for this offense. Well, he didn't emerge as that. And again, I'll throw the Matt Waldman card on this is, you know, Waldman expected him to emerge late in the season as a high end playmaking threat. And I know the argument out there is he can't do a good one. There's Dalton Knox. I think he can do better. And, and I won't be surprised if this year, no matter who they draft, barring a trade for a super high end player at the position at wide receiver, I think Dalton Kincaid will lead this team in, in targets this year. How many, let, let's get aggressive here. How many tight ends would you rather have? Let's throw ADP out the window and cost out the window. How many, or, or maybe I just ask you this, where does uh, Dalton Kincaid rank among tight ends at the end of the 2024 <clears throat> season, Bob? Uh, maybe higher than, maybe higher than we expect, right? Like I, I, I think it's fine buying him at cost right now. He's going to what about wide receiver seven, six, seven, six. He's moving up a little bit. He's wide yeah, up he tight end five now. So 
that seems like maybe a, about the right spot, right? Like Laporta, McBride, Kelsey, Andrews, and then Kincaid as part of that knot of the next group. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think Evan Ingram is being slept on a little bit. You know, if you look down the stretch last year, he was crushing it. I don't know if that's not going to be the case again. Kyle Pitts, we're all very hopeful and with good reason because Kirk Cousins is a is a good quarterback in this regard. I know the Minnesota fans will say, no, he's not. He does not win the playoffs. <laughs> I don't care. Not my battle. Uh, right. But like uh, ahead of guys like George Kittle, ahead of the David and Jokus, who still seems like a bit of a question mark. So many more points with Joe Flacco than he's ever had with Deshaun Watson. I, you know, I don't know that we're going to get that same guy. I mean, yeah, I, I think he's right at the tail end of that first group. So I think five is about the right spot for me. If there were injuries or some other fluky issues, having him move up a little bit seems like totally not unreasonable. I want to take this, the rest of this segment, because we're up against it and flip it a little bit. Um, you said you were behind the curve on these rookies, but I know you've done a lot of podcasts. You've talked to a lot sure. of people. You've consumed a lot of content. Oh, yeah. You have formed opinions about oh, a lot yeah. of these players. Based on what you thought going into this, which wide receiver have you changed your opinion or maybe cemented an opinion on more so than any other one in this rookie class? I think, well, I mean, like the, the opinions are pretty cemented on the top three, but I think Adunze is climbing for me. Mm. I, I think like not climb, but like, like maybe, so I've heard people in, in the, like for the most part, when I first started, you know, discussing the wide receivers, it was, it was all Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Yeah. And then there started to get a little mixture. My buddy John Law starts throwing out the Malik neighbors, and then some other people did that that's their one. I said, well, that's interesting. And then, and then you know, I started paying a little more attention to Roma Dunze, and I'm thinking, well, he's right up there too. And I look at, the, you know, my favorite ranker right now has those. I mean, they're clearly the top three, right? And probably, you know, all within that much space of each other, and landing spot is going to be determinative of who I'm more into. But I think Adunze is the guy, the guy that's grown on me. He's the biggest of the bunch. Maybe that's what it is. I like the bigger players. Uh, and he's very physical. And, you know, now that I start actually paying attention and watching some of the play from college, which I don't do, you know, during the NFL season, I'm not watching any college football. And I see the, you know, I actually see him play. I like the Devontae Adams comparisons I'm seeing with, uh, yeah. with Adunze. So. Yeah. And, and that may, and that makes perfect sense. Like, <laughs> um, Odunze was a guy that I kind of was like, okay, I get why he's below neighbors and sure. Harrison. But the more I read, the more again, the more content I right. consume, I'm kind of like, God, you know, maybe this guy. And this is this is what I always I have boiled it down to with these top three receivers this year. I think the ceiling for Harrison and neighbors is to me what separates those two from Odunze. Probably. I put up, I put them all in the same tier, but I think the ceiling is a little bit higher for those two. Not saying Odunze doesn't have a high ceiling. I mean, I, I think he's going to have a wonderful career. I don't think he's a bust, but I do think that if I have the opportunity, I'm going to draft Harrison. Not that I don't want to do and say shares because I do, but I think Harrison and, and neighbors, I like a little bit more. Yeah, you Shifting, look, Go ahead. Just quickly, you look at the comps on Harrison is the Larry Fitzgerald comp. So we're all, you know, assuming Arizona, and I think that would be a great spot for him. But like, it wouldn't totally surprise me. And I know Bloom has talked about this, if they do the awesome for it again, mm -hmm. right? They move down, out and then back up in and they end up with a Dunze because they've tended to go with a bigger body player. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I like there's some of the other outlier or not outliers, but some of the, you know, outside top three guys that I like the size and speed and everything, the Brian Thomas jr. And the aforementioned Coleman. I think those guys that I'm interested in, look, I'm interested in a lot of the wide receivers just because that's the direction things are going. The players are coming in more prepared. The offenses are better set up at the pro level to take advantage of their skills. So I'm, I'm in on a lot of these guys. Is Brian Thomas jr. Your number four receiver this year? Uh, he, he's right there. Like, so I'm going to probably in dynasty have maybe more shares of Xavier worthy, depending on how my teams are built, because I think he's the difference maker. That speed is to me of the guys, not in the top three, uh, is something that makes him stand out. But if I'm going with a bigger player, it's definitely going to be Thomas next. And that that was my next question with with Worthy. Um, if we look at these guys who have blazed at the combine before, um, there's not a lot of them that went on to have successful <laughs> NFL careers. However, and again, this is something that I've I've read more and more. None of them had the track record, or at right. least the the um, the the <clears throat> they're they're checking more of the boxes that Worthy does. So right. the speed thing, like, is is not only going to help him in the draft, but it's the the rest of his game kind of cements him as like, okay, he's not like these other guys, and here's why. 
Exactly. And I'm like, and I'm old enough to remember when Tyree Kill wasn't viewed as all that great a prospect uh, when he came in and the speed won out and he and look, he turned out to be a much better receiver than people viewed him as. I think worried he may end up there, but you're right. He has the bigger body of work and also the 4-2-1 speed. Yes, that always helps, too. Um, I want to ask you about the Cowboys running back situation. Um, right now, it is uh, Rico Dowdle and potentially Ezekiel Elliott coming back there. But I think everybody is super excited about who the Cowboys could draft on day two. They're probably not going to draft one on, on day one. But Trey Benson or Braylon Allen or, you know, any of these other guys that could be going. Um, it, it, like, how excited? Well, let me ask you this. Let's say it is Benson, Bob. Let's say the Cowboys use a second round pick on Trey Benson in a non super flex one QB mm -hmm. league in your rookie draft. How high do you take Trey Benson in a vacuum? Oh, in, the rookie, that in the rookie draft, he moves right up there outside, you know, one quarterback right outside those yeah. top three receivers, probably. So he's the 104. For oh, you I, mean, I mean, point. Bowers might be up there as well, but, but it, it, like in a dynasty, probably Bowers would be ahead of him, but then he's going to be right in that next group. See, now Bowers is interesting to me because we keep hearing that he could be slipping. Originally, I said uh, I, I said this, well, I've, I've, I've been saying it somewhat recently, but I'm probably going to need to retract it. But I said this year's draft for fantasy football could be so awesome because we could have in the top 10 picks alone, four quarterbacks, three receivers, and a tight end. That's 80% of the top 10 picks being skill position players that we care about for fantasy football. Now, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know if that happens anymore. I think the quarterbacks are in there. I think at least two of the receivers are. I don't know about Bowers, and now they're talking about Bowers slipping. And if Bowers slips, Bob, don't we have to readjust what we think about him for dynasty based on what the NFL is telling us, what they think about Bowers, know. if they do let him slip? I don't know. When did LaForta go? When did, when did Trey McBride go? I don't, so I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll be more about Nita, or maybe it's like other guys are just gaining ground. Ben Sinat's like a guy that more and more people are talking about. Uh, Jatavian Sanders is a guy people have been talking about. Maybe they're gaining a little bit of ground. I don't know. Um, or maybe they're looking at the picture of Bowers next to Gronk and just saying, who's that kid? Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, so like, I do think, I mean, he looks like the guy that can be that lead piece in an offense that can take on that Laporta like role or, you know, some of the other, you know, primary pieces of tight end. I don't see that for me changing. And now maybe, you know, in lying season, as people are starting to tell you things to, uh, you know, to change values, et cetera. Like if he went five to the chargers, I would not be shocked. I mean, I, right. I, I, yeah. I kind of expect him to take an offensive tackle. All just seems like would be a smart choice right there. And based on, you know, Jim Harbaugh's comments, but they have a lot of needs and tight end is one wide receiver is one eventually running back is one. They can't draft every Michigan guy. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be Blake Corum, but, and, and Lord knows all my Gus Edwards shares would like for him to be the only guy there, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't think that's going to be the case either. It's again, it's just, it's more fuel to the fire that this is going to right. be such a fantastic NFL draft to be watching. Uh, and we are basically what uh, two weeks away from it. So two it's going to be awesome. Um, let's do this. Let's um, uh, I want to focus more on dynasty stuff, not necessarily on rookies, but there were some players that changed teams, Bob. And I want to get your perspective on guys like Deontay Johnson in Carolina, sure. Keenan Allen now in Chicago. Let's talk about the Vikings running backs and receivers, not knowing who their quarterback is going to be this year. And then uh, we'll touch on Bryce Young if we have a, if we have a second as well. Sure. This is the High Stakes Fantasy Football Show on the Better Sports Network. Bob Harrison, football guys, Eric Balkman from the FFPC. Don't go anywhere. We're wrapping things up with a boffo fourth segment right after this. If you're not playing Dynasty Fantasy Football right now, where we're still out there doing all sorts of trades and moves, everybody else that does like casual gamers that do redraft, they're done. You know, and they're just kind of speculating or like talking about the draft. We're still playing. Like if you play Dynasty, we play all year. I play over at FFPC. Uh, if you want to play there, use promo code COOP, C-O-O-P. We'll give you 25 bucks when you deposit 35 or more at myffpc.com. And there's two ways to jump in over there. You can either do a startup, in which case you can get Dalton Kincaid way after guys like Sam Laporta and Trey McBride. Brock Bowers, I just saw that the rookie Brock Bowers, even for the draft, they're projecting him to go as like the tight end two in these startup drafts. Crazy, right? Like right after Laporta, which is nuts. Like you can get Kincaid, or if you don't want to do a startup, I think this is even more fun. You go out and take over an orphan team, right? So over at FFPC, they never close the leagues down. They just take the teams and uh, you know, if somebody has to leave or whatever, then you can buy in and take that team. So you can go find a team that has Kincaid or and a bunch of players you like 
and you keep those players, and then you look at all the other players you don't like, and you have the golden opportunity to trade them away. Like it's so much fun to take a team and be like, okay, you know what? Uh, that you know, because if you do a startup, you love all the guys already like those are your babies if you do a uh, an orphan team then you can trade away all the guys you don't like and that's that's even more fun honestly you have the golden uh the green the green light there so go to myffpc.com use promo code coop they'll give you 25 bucks when you deposit 35 or more and you know you'll give you a leg up versus you know starting your own league i gotta chase people down for dues you gotta pay your own money you know so go get set up over there Hey, BSNers, don't forget about the Fantasy Alarm All-Pro subscription, which you can get right now. Unlock content for all sports, including annual draft guides, one-on-one -on -one expert access in the Discord is included. You can analyze matchups and trends in your leagues with the League Sync. Don't forget about the lineup generator integrated with fan injections, daily and weekly rankings, value vault, position coaches, the waiver wire, ownership percentages, projection stats and tools, build better lineups, guaranteed get access to everything fantasy alarm offers all year just use promo code lock at fantasyalarm.com slash lock fantasyalarm.com slash lock i'm being joined by bob harris from footballguys.com this week follow him on the x which you're probably already doing if you're watching this at football diehard bob when did you started to get into dynasty leagues as opposed to just best ball and redraft so I want to think I was a, like a late adopter. So I want to say early 2000s. Uh, and and a lot of that like really ramped up when I started working with Mike Dempsey on the Sirius show, who yep. like, plays almost nothing but Dynasty. Or if, <laughs> if he had his druthers, he would play. Well, if he had his druthers, every league would be 32 teams, 50-man <laughs> rosters, full IDPs, starters at every position. And we do have one of those leagues out there, the diehards, uh, the diehards league. But... But that aside, uh, so that's when I started. I think, like, you want to say around 2005 2000, to, through 2010, I really started ramping it up. And, in fact, I'm going to check my my draft right now. I'm in one right now where we draft our rookies before the NFL. Ooh, uh, spicy. Yeah, how, yeah. This how, is deep, it. how deep are you into that draft right now, Bob? We're into round three, I want to say. It's a super flex league, so the first pick was not Matthew Berry. Uh, took Marvin Harrison. Some of this is with the rosters. Uh, Graham Barfield, uh, Caleb Williams, Evan Silva, Jaden Daniels, uh, Pat Thorman had a couple picks. Got Drake May and Malik Neighbors. Oh. Danny Kelly got Roma Dunze at six overall. Barfield takes Brock Bowers. Davis Maddock in here with Brian Thomas Jr. Scott Barrett, J.J. McCarthy. I traded back from that pick and got Xavier Worthy. I, I had the 109, traded back, got another pick. Only had one pick in the fourth round. I uh, only had two picks in this entire uh, draft. It's a four-round draft. So traded in to get the second pick in the fourth round and moved back and still got the guy I wanted, Xavier Worthy. Troy Flank Franklin went right there. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey, uh, Keon Coleman at 202. So uh, Trey Benson was like one of the, you know, one of the early running backs off there. Uh, Silva got him at 203. So when you talk about, well, okay, so the, obviously a rookie draft, but I want to shift the focus for Dynasty to these to these veterans right now um and i'll leave things off with deontay johnson and let's just talk about the carolina offense sure. in general here and then we'll expand it out to to deontay johnson from dynasty purposes but bryce young in year two there is a lot of chatter in in you on the youtube chat tonight about the panthers offense we heard some chuba hubbard um chatter on there and then other people were saying god why would you want to be in business with the carolina panthers offense it's horrible <laughs> Bob, how do you uh, like? I mean, we we expect some sort of a step forward from Bryce Young this year. The question is, how big and how uh, how does it affect the rest of the skill position guys on this team, including but not limited to Deontay Johnson? I mean, it almost has to be better, right? I mean, it was so bad last year. I think, like, I, I get it. There's, you know, uh, and and I'm, maybe I'm buying into this. Dave Canales has had great success getting quarter, getting the most out of quarterbacks. He's done it with Russell Wilson, Geno Smith. Did it with Baker Mayfield last year. This is why he has a job as a head coach because mm -hmm. David Tepper would like his uh, investment in Bryce Young to pan out. Uh, the problem for Dave Canales is he does not play offensive line, but they added two offensive guards uh, and shored up the middle of that line. And I think that's a great start. Then they added, you've mentioned Deontay Johnson is, you know, adding another piece uh, that I think is a still, I think he's still a very capable player. 
Uh, I'm going to have Matt Harmon on the radio program on Sirius this weekend, Saturday at 3 p.m. <clears throat> and I know he's a big fan of him as a route runner. Uh, doesn't always catch every ball. I would like to see more of that. But look, Bryce Young, I mean, you know, what statistically, I think it's, if not the worst, let me look. It's definitely one of the worst for a quarterback drafted with the top pick. Uh, 11 touchdown passes, 10 interceptions, 59% completion rate. I mean, it was bad, right? Yeah. And, you know, so it's got to get better. I do think, like, I'll have some shares of Deontay Johnson just because I, I think people dial back maybe more than they should. We overcompensate. We do this a lot, Eric, right? I, and I'm, like, a, a big, you know, proponent of – not letting less than ideal quarterback situations scare me off of really good wide receivers. I didn't do it with, uh, with uh, Mike Evans last year and it worked out for me. I can, we can go back the year before where we were all dialed back on Amari Cooper. We were dialed back on DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett both. I mean, thinking that the quarterback situation wasn't going to be great. Well, it doesn't have to be fantastic for some of these really great players to excel. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping for the best for some of the pieces. Well, look no further than Adam Thielen last year. I was happily taking him as a wide receiver six, five or six in best balls last year. And look how that paid off. He was ended up a wide receiver one more weeks than not. So I, I do think there's some hope here in Carolina. I think the change in coaching staff uh, and the work they've done already on the offensive line is, is a good move. They get Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis, uh, the guards they got. That's a, that's a significant upgrade. It was a necessary one. The fears for me are, when I think back to the photographs of Bryce Young standing behind the offensive line last year in training camp, he just looks so, so small. So tiny. Yep. Yeah. You know, and like, look, lots of great quarterbacks have not been big guys. And Drew Brees, he'd like me to know that these quarterbacks under six feet can have success. And so, so I like, I'm hopeful. And I do have like Bryce Young is a guy that I'm getting a lot of shares as quarterback threes, mostly in super flex because. I am underestimating every year, like super flexes take on lives of their own. And it seems like this year, the quarterback angst is way higher than it has been in, la in past years. So, or at least in the leagues I've played in. So I'm finding myself going all of a sudden, wait a minute, <laughs> I need that quarterback three now. And a lot of times it's ending up being Bryce Young just for the job security and nothing else. So hoping he can pick up the pace a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I just wonder, you know, you mentioned Chuba Hubbard. I just I wonder if they're not going to do something at running back in the draft. That seems likely to me, and I, I wonder if we're not going to wish we did not have as many Chuba Hubbard chairs. You know, I I'd say the same of myself talking about Miles Sanders last year. Right. I think there is um, there, there's a couple of uh, things we can talk about here with Carolina uh, that you brought up. Now, um, when you talk about drafting proven receivers or talented receivers with as to, as you put it, less than ideal quarterback situations. Right. The, the first one I think of is Minnesota, right? Because sure. it's it's Sam Darnold probably this year. They could draft J.J. McCarthy. I can't imagine he would be a, a uh, the starter at the start of the season. I think he's going to need some time to marinate. Um, but that Vikings offense, Bob, Addison, Hawkinson, Jefferson, and now Aaron Jones goes into the fold there. How do you view these guys? And 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 let let's just stick the best ball here when it, when I ask you this. How do you view these guys with a quarterback that that is kind of unknown right now, or Sam Darnold? I had uh, a, a, a high stakes player with the FFPC tell me about kind of talk me off the ledge with Jeffrey. He's like, look, the Vikings are not idiots. They're going to they have quarterbacks that are talented enough to get the ball to Justin Jefferson. Maybe he's not breaking any receiver records this year, but he's damn sure going to put up top number or you know top five top six numbers or whatever it is so i've kind of i'm still believing in justin jefferson this year what about the rest of the guys not knowing who the quarterback's going to be in minnesota because that's something we got to figure out for best ball it is a little bit of a concern justin jefferson of course would like you to know that he fared reasonably well with quarterbacks named josh dobbs nick mullins jaron hall i mean like you know like he's still justin jefferson i would like it to be a better quarterback situation uh i'm happy that kevin o'connell would like me to think sam darnold can can be better. I mm -hmm. I agree with that because he cannot be a lot worse. And, and like I said, sometimes a, a reputation follows a guy. I think you know Sam Darnold has never shaken that seeing ghost things. And and whoever was the assistant coach, I can't even remember who it was who who let that out, thinking he was doing Sam Darnold a favor. It cut him out. But it, we've seen him play like competently for brief periods in lesser circumstances or or on worse teams. Carolina Panthers. Um. <laughs> so. 
So like, uh, you know, and, and I have a lot of faith in Kevin O'Connell. I think he's a good coach who puts together a good offense and they've got other good pieces. The addition of Aaron Jones is going to help them as well. Uh, and so, so yeah, I think that maybe this will be a case where we're overestimating. Although Justin Jefferson is not going later, you'll see you'll see guys like Addison going a little later than maybe he should. Aaron Jones definitely going later than I think he should. Um, and uh, and we'll see what happens with whoever the rookie is. If it's JJ McCarthy, I think you know I'm going to have some interest there. But I, I think he, Sam Darnold is going to open the year as a starter. Seems like almost a given to me, and I think he can be competent enough at this point. Do I expect like a Baker Mayfield esque Phoenix like rise? Uh, I don't think it's entirely impossible. Yeah, I was just going to say, I wouldn't expect it, but it wouldn't surprise me right. with, with that with that talent there. Right, it, don't want to bank on it for him. Right. But banking on him being good enough to carry the values of some of the pieces around him, I think, is not unreasonable at all, given the circumstances. Totally, totally agree. The uh, Los Angeles Chargers, uh, what, what an offseason they've had. So Keenan Allen is now a bear. He was traded there. Mike Owens was released. He's been signed by the Jets. Justin Herbert is saying, what is going on? Oh, and by the way, Austin Eckler now with the Washington Washington Commanders. <clears throat> Gerald Everett, his top tight end now is Cole Komet's backup. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, the the uh, the Chargers East, as it were, with Allen and Everett there now. So you have a situation. We already talked about this. Would not surprise either one of us if Bowers goes to the Chargers with pick five. But right now, it is Quentin Johnston. It is Joshua Palmer. It is Justin Herbert. And it is not a ton of other playmakers, including the backfield, um, unless we are to believe uh, that Gus Edwards is going to be a difference maker there. I remain skeptical. Let's talk. Let's talk about the Chargers first off, right. specifically Justin Herbert. This is a guy that has been dropping in in uh, in best ball drafts right now. You look at Justin Herbert right now, quarterback sixteen. Bob, what was he last year? Like quarterback six? This yeah. is a huge drop. Yeah, yeah. This is a huge. This is the kind of drop that gets my attention and probably gets me some shares of Justin Herbert. He's a very good player. Um, look, would I feel better if his top receiver could catch footballs? Yes. <laughs> Quentin Johnston, get on that, sir. Post haste, please. Uh, but, I mean, like uh, you have to expect them to make at least, you know, to, to make additions at all these, you know, at all the skill positions. Uh, can they round up enough? Jim Harbaugh has a nice history of turning things around quickly. Mm -hmm. And you look back in the past, like granted, especially working with Greg Roman, you're expecting a run heavy offense that will require Justin Herbert to be very efficient. We've seen that though at times. He's never going to be a Lamar Jackson or Colin Kaepernick you know, rudder, but he's not immobile. And right. so, you know, think of something more along the lines of what we saw from Alex Smith during the time in San Francisco. Didn't have a great receiving core there, but Vernon Davis was viable. There were periods of time. I want to say Michael Crabtree had a good season or two. And, and efficiency wise, Alex Smith was viable. I think Justin Herbert is probably a better player just overall than Alex Smith and maybe can get a little done. I also think, you know, like the wild rumors of some kind of trade where Justin Herbert ends up somewhere else and JJ McCarthy who ends up in Los Angeles. Like I like nothing would shock me, but that would surprise me. <laughs> yes. Right. <clears throat> like, you know, the money and all the things that go with that, just like it all seems like too fantastical uh to pull off. So I would like to believe that, you know, and, and we can go back in in Jim Harbaugh's history to San Diego State with Josh Johnson that put up yep. really good numbers as a passer there. Uh, this kid named Andrew Luck put up some pretty decent numbers as a passer at Stanford under Jim Harbaugh. Although I don't think, I think Pat Thorman threw that number out uh, a while back on the X machine that, you know, never averaged more than 30 pass attempts a game. Mm. So again, efficiency is going to be key. Uh, but Herbert's at the po point now where it's just so cheap and he's such a good player that I'm going to have some shares. His former uh, number one receiver now in Chicago. Is he the number one receiver in Chicago? According to the FFPC ADP data, uh, that is not accurate. DJ Moore, wide receiver 16 at the 309. Keenan Allen, Bob, wide receiver 29 at the 601. Do you oh, like the so Allen? Much, so it's, much Allen. So much Allen. So that's you're buying the value on Allen. Here. I'll buy the value. Like, and I'm a big DJ Moore fan. I think he's a phenomenal player, has been consistently high end playing with a series of crappy quarterbacks right i mean you look at his time in carolina and the numbers he put up consistent production even in chicago with you know less than ideal quarterback situation for him i think you know whatever you think of justin fields uh you know i mean he's not a well-developed passer the, the badgeant era he didn't do well but still dj moore ended up having a super effective season but you look at keenan allen and I, we we try to dismiss him every year last year i think before what he got hurt was he not wide receiver two 
Yeah. I mean, he just keeps getting it done. He's a just such a great route runner and creates separation and makes it hard for his quarterback to look away from him. And I think Caleb Williams, they tell me this kid is very good. Uh, I'm thinking he'll be able to find him. But the price, to me, is the determining factor. I will have shares of that all day long at that price. As long as it remains at that price, I'll have a ton of Keenan Allen. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, more than two rounds of disparity. Now, I, I think DJ Moore ends up being having the better stats, but Maybe not so. that much better. Maybe so. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, and, there, and, and there's a yeah, I'm mean, definitely there's a non-zero chance that right. Allen ends up outscoring him this year too. I don't know if you are a fan of Jim Gaffigan's comedy, but I think about one Jim Gaffigan joke when I think about Mike Williams on the Jets. Jim Gaffigan has his famous hot pocket routine, and one of the things he says about a hot pocket is I've never eaten a Hot Pocket, and then after I was done eating it, I said, you know what? I'm really glad I ate that. <laughs> I think about Mike Williams at Fantasy Football with the Jets this year. Am I going to draft him this year, Bob? And then at the end of the season, am I going to say, gee, I'm really, I'm really glad I, I drafted Mike Williams when I did. I don't know if I will. I think this is one of the things that sounds good in my head right now to take Mike Williams, and I'll get you his ADP here in a second, to get Mike Williams at the wide receiver 50 in the 11th right. round. And, 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 like, that sounds great now, but at the end of the season, I don't know if I'm going to feel the same way. I don't either. I think, like, this might be MetLife Turf 1, Williams 0 by the time the season's over. But, and I don't know if he's going to be ready. Now we're hearing maybe he's not going to be ready for week one. So, I don't know. Again, the price is right. There will be shares anytime I hit the double digit rounds and I see a, what is likely to be the wide receiver too, assuming he's in the locked and upright positions, playing with a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers alongside a receiver like Garrett Wilson, mm -hmm. who is going to, you know, keep opposing defenses very honest, right? Their coverages. Um, and we'll see. I think they may draft, a, you know, somebody will, uh, I think they'll draft another wide receiver. Uh, Tayshon, uh, Gibson, what is it, Xavier Gibson? I don't know that he's the real deal. Yeah. Um, at this point, and, and maybe maybe they add a tight end. Maybe Brock Bowers ends up there. Um, but I but I do think that that Williams at price, I'll probably have some shares. But I'm with you. I don't like feel great about it after I pick him. You know, and, and just to give everybody an idea, this is like uh, Adonai Mitchell, Tyler Lockett, Jacoby Myers, Khalil Shakir, for yep. goodness' sake, uh, Curtis Samuel, Jamison Williams. Xavier Worthy, all these guys are going right around Mike Williams. Cortland Sutton, another guy, too, in Denver who could be the right. number one receiver there. So, like, like, you have to equate it like, okay, yeah, maybe Mike Williams hits, but am I willing to sacrifice all those other players, shares that that's I can those players there instead of Mike Williams? And, and that's where I kind of draw the line. Um, we talked a little bit about the Bears' this segment with Everett and, and Allen. DeAndre Swift is in Chicago, too, Bob. Um, he uh, played last year in Philadelphia, had a pretty good season. Um, suffered the Philadelphia tush push um, push back on his uh, touches at the goal line. Does he reclaim those? Does he have a big season in Chicago this year? I have like, I, I want to say I'm double checking. I think I have zero shares. Wow. <laughs> zero. DeAndre, De before he answered, I'll tell everybody right now, DeAndre Swift running back 22 at the 707 ADP right now. <sighs> Yeah, I'll have I'll end up with more Javante Williams. I think Mostert's going in that same range right now. I'll probably have more Pollard, more way more James Conner for sure. So why do you know, hate Swift? Like, why it's do a, you it's hate Swift? A, it's a, like we all have players where we have blind swap spots, mm -hmm. right? And like I want to say, like it's like I'm injury agnostic. So it's not that I sit here and I like I avoid players because they have an injury history. It's not that. I just don't know if he's in the right place at the right time. I I think I'd it, I I do have a lot of Khalil Herbert shares or more mm -hmm. Khalil Herbert shares, and maybe I'm just hoping those turn even better when they trade him to Dallas after they miss on their running back in the draft. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I I don't really have a good reason because I think DeAndre Swift proved that he can be a very good player last year. Just having him be consistently good, it just hasn't seemed to happen. And maybe at some point you start listening to the coaches like. Here's a big thing I'm big on, and I talk about it with Jordan Love a lot because I think we all like weren't sure what we had in Jordan Love, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but I said, you know, the Packers are known to be a relatively competent organization. I don't think you let a four-time MVP kick his way out the door, even with a lousy relationship, unless you're reasonably sure you have a guy who can at least cover for you, right? And I feel like DeAndre Swift, everyone lets him move on. And, and it makes me wonder, like, and the, the thing is, teams know what they have, 
right? We see the tip of the iceberg on Sundays, the you know, and just the brief moments, right? And he looks good in those brief moments. What does he look like the rest of the time? Yeah. That makes teams feel like they can move on from him without any penalty, right? And that's that's the thing that that maybe maybe sticks in my craw a little bit about him. And maybe it shouldn't. It's like, I totally acknowledge that sometimes we get blind spots for players and I'm as guilty of it as anybody. And I may be guilty of it with Swift. Well, I mean, the thing is like, there, there's no shame in liking the other players around him. better right. too. I mean, like that it's, what have we said this whole show? It is your team. Yes. We give the advice. We know the players out there, but it is ultimately your team. You don't want Swift on your team. Don't draft them. There's plenty. Of other I need players. to get some shares though. I, I guess well, I mean, listen, I'm in. <laughs> there, there is a FOMO aspect for volume players out there. I told, I totally get that. Uh, Bob Harris joining me tonight on the high stakes fantasy football show. So all your work at, Football diehard on the X, footballguys.com. We can yep. check out and the daily newsletter, sign up for that. You're doing yep. takes and, and giving news in there as well. I, um, you always produce the, um, the, the YouTube podcast, yep. sort of like a catch all every week for fantasy, which is fantastic. Um, and then the Sirius XM show. Why don't you pl- uh, plug that with Mike Dempsey here? Yeah, right now, you know, this time of year, it's baseball season is serious. So we're mm-hmm. on once a week, Saturdays, three to five. I'll be solo this week. Matt Harmon will be on with me. I think we're doing, um, doing uh, Seahawks. Tim Booth from the Associated Press, any Jaguars beat writer on. We kind of like to dig in pre-draft, and we'll do it throughout the year. Um, and then draft coverage will be a big part of that, as we always are. I think uh, Thursday night, uh, you know, Dempsey will be leading that. I'll be in for quick hits on every single skill player that's drafted. Same again Friday night. I'll do a wrap-up show Friday night uh after the draft is over from like 11 to 1 saturday we'll be on from 4 to 7 and then we'll host the post draft draft the annual tradition at sirius on sunday afternoon so check all that out and then as the season gets nearer we will ramp up the workload and and move up in the uh, rotation a little bit as football season takes over uh, the network, which doesn't take too long once the draft happens. Yeah, I can't get here soon enough. I look forward to all that draft coverage, reading more at footballguys.com, and, of course, continue to follow you at Football Die Hard. Bob Harris, thank you so much. A gentleman, a scholar, one of the best people in the business. Thank you for spending your Thursday evening with you, my friend. Thank you, Eric. I had a great time. You did a great job with this and uh, and set me up and made it very easy. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, and next week I'll be setting up Scott Pianowski yes. from Yahoo. So that'll be a lot of fun from seven to nine. That is who our guest will be. I want to thank Bob Harris, Matt Deutsch, our producer. Check out myffpc.com, Fantasy Pros Championship, Empire Leagues, Dynasty Leagues, and of course the Never Too Early Best Ball Tournaments. Thank you so much for watching. For Bob Harris, I'm Eric Balkman. See you next week.